one of them now that I went to the buffalo. <laughs> Looks like a leg. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm calling to order the November 9th, 2022 Board of Trustees, Open Space Board of Trustees meeting. And I um, want to begin by calling the roll. John Carroll. Present. Michelle Estrella. Here. Carol Carol Miller. Miller. Present. Dave Kunz. Here. And I'm Karen Holwick, and I'm the chair, and I'm here. Allison, would you like to go ahead and read the rules for the meeting? Sure. Thank you for joining us this evening. The city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and council and board members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. For more information about this vision and the community engagement process, you can visit, visit the city's web pages on productive atmospheres. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person, obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited and participants are, are required to sign up to speak using the name they are commonly known by and individuals must display that name before being allowed to speak online and it will be audio testimony only at this time, no video. Thank you. Uh, Caroline has asked for me to call on her at this point. Hi, thank you. Um, so my name is Caroline Miller, and I am a trustee for the Open Space Board of Trustees, the official appointment from 2020 to 2025. I am speaking tonight to preserve the record and seek relief related to preserving and protecting the record of the Open Space Board of Trustees. My statement will only take a few short minutes. I will not be asking questions, and I will not be taking questions. When I'm done speaking, I will be dismissing myself from the November 9th, 2022 Open Space Board of Trustees meeting. I will not be present for any portion of the November 9th, 2022 OSBT board meeting thereafter. I'm alleging this packet contains material differences from past OSBT packets. I believe there's a material difference in the metadata of this packet. There's a material difference from the usual authors of this OSBT packet, and that there is material difference in the rules of procedure in this packet. On November 3rd, 2022, there was a city council meeting. Council member Rachel Friend spoke, and I believe it is important to preserve the record to state four sentences that were said during that meeting. Council member Rachel Friend stated um, in her discussions about OSBT, OSMP, excuse me, part of the county shuttle that goes from Chautauqua to El Dorado and wanting a stop at South Mesa Trailhead and OSMP, that the feedback I got was that there were concerns that might increase, you know, too much increase on open space use by people using that shuttle. It's now 6.05 of the Wednesday, November 9th, 2022, Open Space Board of Trustees meeting, and I will be reading a sentence um, spoken by council member Rachel Friend at the November 3rd, 2022, city council meeting. I have concerns if that's the philosophy of one of the main participants there, the next sentence that I am quoting from council member Rachel Friend says, I'm not saying it shouldn't be a vote, but I don't know if there is a countervailing. 
The next sentence that I'm quoting from council member Rachel Friend states, if we cut off the people who would shuttle there and we cut down parking spaces there, then who can use open space? It's really, um, as far as I can tell, people who have the money to live right near open space. And so I'm very skeptical of us, not the end of the sentence, but that's where I will stop quoting. Continuing quoting council member Rachel Friend at the November 3rd, 2022 city council meeting. She states the following, maybe inviting into that conversation, the lens of reducing numbers, possibly on open space, because that is what happened on the one area I'm aware of where parking and shuttles and open space intersected. The last sentence that I will be reading, quoting council member Rachel Friend at the November 3rd, 2022 city council meeting states as follows, wanted to understand um, how, why, open space and who else is, is, may be going to be invited into that conversation to make sure that there is, that there is a really strong focus on, on equity and um, our transportation goals. That concludes me quoting a few sentences from Rachel Friend at the November 3rd, 2022 City Council meeting. It is now 6.07 on Wednesday, November 9th, 2022. I am demanding for preservation of all the November 9th, 2022 OSBT board packet and any and all related metadata that any and all communications on any electronic devices owned or in possession of by an open space board of trustee, city official, OSMP staff, or any related city of Boulder departments, that there will be a receipt of communication with city attorney and or city manager for procedural steps to create a new document, speaking of the OSPT, November 9th, 2022 packet. Procedural steps will be taken to provide safeguards to provide the record of the Open Space Board of Trustees board meetings. All communication from the November 9th, 2022 OSPT board meeting will be transcribed by an official court reporter and added to the record. Notarization and signatures designated upon completion of a new document and or clerk of court for certification. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. I am Caroline Miller, Open Space Board of Trustees City Official. It's now 6.08 on Wednesday, November 9th, 2022. And I will be excusing myself from this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes. And as is usually our custom, um, I'm going to ask for additions or revisions on page one first and then on page two. So for the uh, October 12th Open Space Board of Trustees minutes, does anybody have any corrections on page one? I don't know. Okay. Page two. Um, I have one small addition to the first partial paragraph at the top, at the end of the first three lines, um, to add and specific work to pre prevent creation of new undesignated trails that we discussed at that point in the meeting. So the addition is, and specific work to prevent creation of new undesignated trails. At the end, Karen, right at the, yeah, okay. yeah. Any other revisions or suggestions on page two of the minutes from October 12th? I don't have any. Okay. Um, any concerns about the addition that I suggested? Okay, then we're ready for a motion to approve the meeting, the minutes meeting. Um, um, so moved. All second. Thanks. Uh, all in favor? Can we do?
Can we do voice votes now or do we have to do? I would still, if you could still do it by person. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, Michelle? Yes. John? Yes. Dave? Yes. And I vote yes as well. <clears throat> so the minutes for October 12th, they're approved. Uh, and now we're ready to go to public comment, Allison. Okay, we had three people sign up in advance. And then I do see some hand, hands raised uh, <coughs> from those joining us. Let's see. See if I see any names from anyone who signed up in advance. I don't think. Allison, I can read. I sent it in a team, but if you didn't see it, I No, I have it. I wrote it now. Okay, I do see Cindy. So, Cindy, you're up first. And if Richard Harris, yep, Richard Harris, you're on deck. So, Cindy, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Right. And if you just can go ahead and state your full name and then the timer will start. Uh, my name is Cindy Warren. My screen is just now a clock start. Yep. I'm speaking on behalf of Sombrero Marsh. The marsh is a critical wildlife habitat, a wetland, and rep riparian area in a significant natural community. It has undergone tremendous encroachment in recent years. On November 17th, the city is slated to annex 40 plus acres from BVSD at 6,500 Arapaho and approve construction of a factory there to produce modular homes. Construction is scheduled to begin in January to February of 2023. Although the marsh is within approximately 750 to 1,000 feet of the proposed factory site, no environmental impact study was performed. The factory will be almost as large as a football field. It will be made of metal, which is an excellent conductor of sound. And it will be building homes with noisy equipment, including forklifts, backup alarms, air compressors, nail guns, and power saws. The factory has the capacity to build up to 50 to 80 homes a year. It will be a real factory and it will be very loud. The marsh is a noise sensitive environment. In the county review document dated September 9, 2021, it is stated that nuisance factors such as visual impacts, light, noise, vibration, fumes, et cetera, will be associated with the factory. All these factors will obviously affect the wildlife at the marsh. The plans for the factory have all traffic, including very large trucks with building supplies and very large trailers carrying modular homes traveling along 63rd Street. 63rd Street is a small two-lane street, which is approximately 20 feet from the marsh. The intense traffic will have an extremely disruptive effect on all of the wildlife. There is an alternative route of 65th Street, which could be used, and this is a significantly greater distance from the marsh. The mechanics of waste disposal have not yet been addressed, but will likely also be loud. Additionally, there is no plan in place to provide buffers for the marsh. Although the county review document mentions open space buffers, the regional open space consists of flat grassland and wetlands with very sparse trees. The open space will provide minimal sound mitigation. In the city planning board document from their September 6th meeting, it was stated that the factory would not increase impacts to the marsh. It's difficult to understand how this could be possible. I am hopeful you can intervene on behalf of the marsh seems like a terrible waste to sacrifice a critical wildlife habitat for a factory that could be built elsewhere. If the factory site can't be moved, please do everything in your power to minimize the very significant negative factory effects, as well as provide meaningful mitigation. Thank you for any help you can provide. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Okay, up next is Richard Harris, and on deck will be Lynn Siebel. Richard, you should be able to unmute now. Yep. I think, can you hear me? Yep, sounds good. Good. Go ahead. So, so I want to talk about the uh, agenda item uh, tonight about um, um, e-bikes. And um, I only heard about it yesterday, and it's an extraordinarily contentious issue, issue in Boulder, 
uh, as was demonstrated during the West, Tra West Trail study fight. You should realize that the conflict between hikers and bikers is at least as bad when the bike is powered by a motor. In fact, it's worse. It took about two years for the West TSA to resolve the last conflict about bikes. I was very active in something called SOS Balter, and maybe you can see I still have a button, meaning save open space. Um, it, we, the council was required to hold a hearing in Boulder High School Auditorium. There were so many people. Uh, there were about 100 talks, and eventually biking in the West TSA uh, was banned as it had been earlier in 1985. Springbrook and Dowdy Draw Trails added bikes and their use for hiking went essentially to zero. Recognize that Boulder uh, County allows more uh, biking, uh, more use of biking, but their trails are not so heavily used by hikers as the city trails. Their goals are not as heavily disposed to environmental preservation. Therefore, they're not, this is not so relevant. It's extremely dangerous to mix walkers and bikers. And e-bikes will be more dangerous than manual ones because they can weigh more than 50 pounds, plus, of course, the rider. I haven't mentioned the loss of peace and quiet that should come from a quiet walk in the wilderness. Impossible with the fear of being run over by a bike. Imagine grandmother pushing child in a stroller and having the bike crash into them. Serious injury. Death? When? If not. Don't forward this to council. You will just embarrass them. But if you persist in, um, make, make sure you add an alternative D, which is no changes to the present situation. And if you're going to pursue this horrible idea, do give me a chance to post the SOS website on your server so that you can review the history that went on that according to the present packet, uh, staff are unaware of. So this is not new information for you. I believe the SOS website was given on a CD to the staff for historical purposes. If you can't find it, I have a copy. And you should also provide maps showing where the e-bikes will be allowed. That's all I have to say. Sorry it was so quick and abrupt, but there's, I'm out of time. Thank you, Richard. Okay, up next we have Lynn Siegel and we had Alex Cassidy sign up ahead of time. I don't see that name here tonight, but if you join- He's on the screen over there. Oh, Alex. Oh, I wonder what I, I'm seeing a different screen. Okay, so Lynn, we'll have you go next and then Alex Cassidy will be on deck. And I'll figure out what I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn, you should be able to unmute now. Who am I speaking to? The Open Space Board of Trustees and Open yes, Space who, Power. Who was addressing, who, was, who just told me to unmute? Allison. Allison, thanks. I would like to see who I'm talking to. I would like to not see a box with numbers on it. I am addressing the OSBT, not three minutes and a timer. Like Cindy mentioned this also. Would you please put the timer in one of the video windows? Um, Lynn, we're in a new room tonight. Uh, so we're still working on figuring everything out. We're hoping to be able to get there by next month. I hope so, because I really don't like addressing a timer. I like addressing human beings. And it's bad enough that you refuse to see me. And I blame you, not the city council, because you need to go to city council and say, your public needs to be seen by you. Because we exist. And I want to be seen. That is so rude. And now I can't even see you except little tiny ant-like images. It's really infuriating to be angry just because of these kind of things to start with. I've got enough to be angry about after See You South. And I want to see an open space <laughs> land disposal 
ballot measure. That's what I want to see next. And I want it worded the way that people aren't confused. Because guess what? We won with CU. We just didn't know it. Because everyone voted no because they thought that's saying no to CU. And believe me, I listen to every planning board and every city council meeting, and I follow eight city boards, and I heard multiple, multiple times <coughs> that folks wanted to change the wording to make it fair. So now we got trouble. Now we need a real ballot measure worded fairly if we want to give up our friggin' open space to see you <coughs> for the state, if we want to do that. I don't think we want to do that. I don't think that ballot measure would win. Now, I don't know what Caroline was about tonight, but I'm upset about it. I've had a lot of talks with Caroline. I really like Caroline. I did hear Rachel Friend mention the statement she was talking about at one point, because something that disturbed me was Rachel said, well, I have to drive to get to the open space. Well, you know what, Rachel? I had to save up my life savings and not spend a penny to buy a house that was near the open space. And you chose not to, apparently. You know, so sometimes it's not that simple. You choose to drive. I drive once every six months. Um, let's see. I agree about Sombrero March, and I'm concerned about our open space with the growth that's threatening this city. Done. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, last <clears throat> up we have Alex Cassidy. Alex, you should be able to unmute now. All right, can you hear me? Yep. All righty, well, good evening. I wanted to uh, chat a little <clears throat> bit about Sombrero Marsh and uh, the adjacent open space. So um, adding to Cindy's comments earlier, um, basically, uh, there is a, the Boulder Valley School District has a campus at 6500 Arapahoe, and behind that campus, there is a piece of open space that wraps around it. And so, um, the plan for this factory is not only going to impact Sombrero Marsh, but it's also going to affect the adjacent open space. Um, and this factory is going to be about 31,000 square feet. It's going to be a massive amount of paving. There's going to be a massive increase in use intensity on the site. Um, there's going to be a massive increase in traffic. And uh, all these things are going to affect Sombrero Marsh. And they're also going to affect the adjacent open space. So I live in the area Here. and walk often in the open space. And uh, I can tell you that there are lots of critters that live there, including uh, a pair of hawks. There's a bunch of uh, old growth cottonwoods that grow in the ditches, the irrigation, I guess it's called the enterprise ditch. Um, and those hawks uh, hang out there. But we have lots of other birds. We have foxes, raccoons. We occasionally hear something that sounds like a coyote yipping in the distance and lots of other critters. And this factory, uh, as Cindy had mentioned about the noise, is going to have a significant impact on the area. So definitely concerned about that. One of the biggest concerns is lighting. And the factory, according to uh, what we've been told, the factory is going to be compliant with the city's dark sky uh, ordinance, 9916. And 
the um, the issue there is that that ordinance is almost 18 years old. It doesn't account for LED lighting, and it doesn't account for the uh, what would be considered um, a minimum standard of care for outdoor lighting. So we're concerned about the lighting and disruption of circadian rhythms of the wildlife. And so uh, that's another that's another thing that's going on with that development. So if you can uh, take a look at this, maybe go take a walk out there and uh, advocate for that open space and sombrero marsh, we would certainly greatly appreciate your uh, support. Um, you know, going to the going to council, I guess. I don't know who you go to. Anyway, that's, I guess I'm out of time, so thank you. Thank you, Alex. Okay, and I don't see any other hands, so I think that's it. Okay, thank you, Allison. Um, the next item on the agenda is matters from the board, and this is our opportunity to comment on the things that uh, the public has already spoken about or to ask questions about the information items attached to our packet for tonight. Um, and before we get any comments from the board, what I'd like to do is ask Dan to explain from a staff's perspective what the status is of the work that um, Cindy and Alex have described that's being proposed for Sumber the Sombrero Marsh area. Sure, I, mean, I can give you <clears throat> some ideas in terms of the process and how city staff collaborate on, on, on a project like this. So this is a project where the lead department is city planning. Um, I believe that the city planning board um, um, provided uh, feedback and input uh, into the process. Um, I don't recall, but I think it was, uh, they provided some comments and, a, and, and forwarded a recommendation at a, a five zero vote, I believe. And it's now in council's hands because it's uh, Boulder Valley School District. The process is a little bit more unique in terms of the annexation application and the approval process. Uh, Boulder Valley School District, uh, uh, from a legal perspective, um, uh, uh, does not uh, need to go through, uh, follow all the formal processes that a normal private landowner would be. So in this case, it is a uh, intergovernmental agreement uh, with a annexation uh, application that council is considering, and it's a negotiated process at this point. Um, I, I, so the background and how department staff would be involved in this is that our staff does participate and serve on what is called the development review committee. Uh, that consists of various staff throughout uh, departments, and when development applications come uh, before the city, uh, we have a chance to provide our input and comments uh, and, and, and make note of any particular concerns or subject matters or issues that ought to be, uh, from our perspective, looked at too. In this particular case, we did have our resource staff uh, that was uh, asked to uh, uh, provide any comments, and we provided some comments into the process uh, through that development review committee type of uh, process into planning staff. So we had, we made comments on such things as uh, uh, noise, runoff, um, uh, those type of uh, concerns that we would typically raise and bring up when development is adjacent to or near or in the vicinity of open space lands. So we did have that opportunity and we did provide that feedback uh, into the process. Um, at this point, uh, I think it was alluded to by some of the uh, comments tonight, that it is the agreement is now uh, uh, before council, and, uh, and I don't have the particular date of when that might be considered next, but I believe it's very soon. Um, maybe uh, before we leave, I could provide a okay a date for what council might be in, might be considering the matter. And do you happen to know whether there's a public hearing before council or not? Um, I do not know for sure. And do you know the uh, exact location of the proposed facility? Well, it's certainly on um, Boulder Valley School District property. It's on their campus area. Uh, a good part of, of, of this future uh, plan would be where, if anybody's familiar with that, I believe it's where there used to be a lot of bus 
storage area and buses used to come in and access that road uh, uh, that's kind of behind the site. So um, a, a good part of the property, uh, uh, I believe is still paved. I believe nearby that area, there used to be an old filling station. And again, a lot of bus storage uh, used to take place in that location. I am not clear right now is exactly how that, how that particular part of the campus is utilized, uh, but I know that that was some former uses. Did we, uh, in our comment, oh, let me back up. Was it referred to, to us as an adjoining landowner? Yeah, typically because we have land in the vicinity, uh, we would be asked to see if we had any feedback uh, from the staff perspective. And, and so did our comments include uh, potential impacts or effects on educational uh, activities out there and uh, that sort of thing? I am un I am not sure, Dave. Um, uh, I'll have to double check on that. So, uh, just as a personal comment, mm -hmm. Sombrero Marsh, uh, the history of Sombrero Marsh uh, since World War II ha has been one of a target area for development throughout the the uh, many decades and the school district at one time in the 60s uh, were proposing to build a you know a football stadium there uh, fill in the marsh and, and make that a uh, you know boulder valley school district uh, football facility uh, eventually that uh, was was um, not approved and an open space did uh, come in and uh, acquire the land and actually work with the school district on developing uh, both restoring uh, parts of the marsh and developing the educational uh, facility there. This just feels to me like a requiem for sombrero. I mean, you, you can't keep, especially on a fragile site like that, you know, it's surrounded now by subdivisions. Um, you know, with this proposal, I, I just can't conceive that an area that, that is that small is going to be able to maintain, you know, its uh, real value for the community. And, uh, that's the saddest part. Uh, <coughs> I think that uh, we as uh, adjoining landowners, and especially given our cooperative for work with the school district, that um, we really need to question the this proposal, and I, I guess I'm just well flabbergasted that uh, the county has moved ahead and, and views that this is an appropriate uh, development adjacent to, you know, what we as the open space uh, department have called the, uh, you know, a, ha a very high quality uh, wildlife habitat. So anyway, I'm, I'm extremely concerned, and I don't I don't know how much longer and how many other proposals this area can really tolerate before it ceases to really function. And its its real value is that it, it does serve as a, a, a really excellent wildlife habitat in an urban context. And that is uh, unusual, except around the city of Boulder, the open space uh, generally serves that function as well. And that's a very special attribute uh, for the uh, the program. And are, are you suggesting that the open space board of trustees take any action or not? Well, I, yeah, I would uh, defer to Dan to uh, kind of get your uh, thoughts on kind of where things stand in the process. I guess uh, I was unaware of this proposal until we got a, a couple of letters or Emails, emails. Um, and so I'm I'm not sure exactly what role, if any, the open space board uh, might have. Yeah, uh, council's going to be uh, be considering the IGA and, and application on uh, November seventeenth. And planning board, I believe, provided weighed in in September. Thank you.
Uh, well, it, it, it just feels like the can's kick pretty far down the road. And uh, I don't know, um, <clears throat> you know, if, if uh, Open Space Board or the Open Space Department, uh, in really, if it's in council's hands, um, I guess the only thing we can do right now is then uh, make a comment uh, at the council. I am very disappointed, though, to hear that uh, the various government agencies have, um, if not approved this, it's certainly uh, you know accepted. Yet I, I just don't understand that, and given the significance of uh, that particular area and the school district's role, in it, I just I don't understand. It, it doesn't sound to me like there's any opportunity for us to intervene and say stop. But I'm wondering whether we might uh, express our concerns to council and ask for more rigorous constraints. Uh, we I, could probably post that, I guess. John, John or Michelle, do you have any comments about this or thoughts about what, if anything, we should pursue? I guess I would be a, a bit hesitant to try to weigh in on it. Um, Dave, I know you, you understand the issues a lot more than, than I do, having been staff. Um, just, just being, just feeling undereducated on the issue. Well, the, the bottom line, Michelle, is it's a typical development proposal that's encroaching further and further into uh, a wildlife habitat, and and the issue is, you know, how, how much more can an area like that tolerate before it ceases to, you know, really function this it has uh, historically. Yeah. And I don't, I don't understand the school. That's why I'm, I'm a little con uh, confused as to the location. I just don't understand the school district's willingness to do this in conjunction with both their administrative facility and the educational element uh, associated with the march. I, I, I don't understand that. Yeah, when you brought up the educational use of the marsh, which is one of the primary uses of this open space area, I can't begin to imagine leading a class of students down there and saying, listen to what this wonderful marsh sounds like <laughs> with a factory going on next door. Right. John, comments? Um, <clears throat> So am I to understand that this is property that's owned by the school district that they're going to build a factory on? Is that incorrect? That's my understanding. School district is building a factory? Um, I, be I believe it's city housing, actually. It's going to be leading that project. And Dave, you mentioned a county uh, project. It's actually the city uh, uh, negotiated agreement and annexation, not not county. But the area was previously oh, right. in the it, Yeah, it's in the county. Yeah. It right. proposed to be annexed. Right. So part of the construction of the factory is to annex that property into the city. Yes. Yeah, it's, 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 there's an annexation uh, with it, with the IGA. Yes. It would be annexed into the city? Yes. I mean, it seems appropriate for us to express our concerns to council. It is that seems to be what you're proposing? Well, that's the only thing that I can think. The only action that I can think of that might be appropriate at this point, as as we all know, it sounds like it's really far down the road, and we're learning about it today. I also learned about it today for the first time with the email from Ed. I can't remember his last name. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would not be opposed to letting them know we're concerned about impacts on open space. Michelle, does that make sense to you? 
Yeah, I guess um, if we're having like just a general um, statement that says that we are concerned about the impacts to open space and would like to know, potentially understand more about what they are. Um, like at a high level, I'm like, it sounds like it's a parking lot that was used for, it's a paved parking lot that was used for buses that were going in and out and had a gas station part of it. So that's why I'm, I'm having a little bit of difficulty trying to see how the how that really is better or worse than a bunch of buses going through there. Yeah, the, the bus use of, of that area was uh, very time constrained. I mean, they would they they would leave in the morning and come back, you know, after their ride and same in the afternoon. There were gas, and I don't know that there still are, but there were gas pumps uh, on that parking lot where the buses did, uh, you know, fill up with gas. But it, it wasn't a constant presence. And in fact, um, you know, there was kind of de facto public parking there. And so the, the use of that particular area, if it's the area I'm thinking of, uh, was very sporadic. And I would say occasional. I, in the times that I've been out there, I have very rarely, and I'm trying to think if I've ever seen any buses this was in years past, that I've seen any buses actually uh, come in and, and use that area. Uh, certainly there was some, you know, school district uh, vehicles, the maintenance vehicles occasionally and stuff, but it, it, it certainly was in a constant presence that uh, a prefab factory uh, presents. I'll just make note that 1117, there obviously will be a council memo associated with this. Um, and I'm happy to forward that on to the trustees. Uh, but that's a little bit after the fact of tonight's meeting, but. <laughs> well, I think that would be very helpful. But what I'm thinking is that, you know, if, if the president board members feel uh, it's appropriate that we could draft up a comment, and I think Karen is chair. You might, you know, read that uh, at the council meeting as a, a, you know a, a comment from the open space board. Okay, if we were to do that, let's talk about process. Would um, so the packet I'm assuming comes out five days before the council meeting. Uh, or, yeah, I believe the preliminary would already be out and final would be in our hands, uh, yeah, with, within the next couple of days. Okay, so we would have approximately a week to review the packet and, and create a draft of a statement. Um, and my question is, would the board like to review a draft or empower a subcommittee to create a draft and have me or maybe Dave present it at the council meeting. I just want to make sure we're clear on the procedure and what's going to happen by whom and when. Uh, I'll make a suggestion that, that okay. you and I, Karen, uh, draft up uh, a comment, um, send it to Dan, who then can send it out to the uh, board members for their review and comment. And then if uh, we get the unanimous head nod, um, we can finalize the comment and one of us can do <coughs> it as the, you know, as a comment from the board of trustees. <coughs> Does that process meet? Go ahead. So so the sequence would be we'd have something to actually some materials to read in like two days is that we said Dan. Yeah, I think um, the packet the packet was due today, so even probably tomorrow morning I could provide the two of you with a packet so you know. Is this the council? The packet council packet for November seventeenth. Yeah. So we could I all think. get that right, so and then we would know what ought to be 
that that what we're actually delegating um, Dave and Karen to to write about. And then you and and everybody else on the board would get a draft of what we're suggesting. Um, is council making a decision on the 17th or are they just reviewing it? Um, I, I believe it might be the, uh, the consideration. We just may get in trouble with sunshine laws. Yeah, because we get a I'm, draft. I'm wondering if it matters if we present it the 17th or if we wait, get the packet, we could review it and talk at next month's meeting and oh, and whether and, and have a better sense of like what's being proposed and you know what we're agreeing our statement is. If there's no rush uh, to make that statement, yeah, I think the 17th. I mean, you know, council can do what what they want, but I do believe that they're going to be considering. Some motions and doing some consideration on the 17. Good. And can you also include the, the whatever the pertinent staff comments were so that we kind of we the board we the subcommittee has some sense of kind of what information has been so and comments, that yeah. we can refer to if you know if that's appropriate and useful. Um, can you also speak about the sunshine loss that Michelle mentioned? Um, yeah, Michelle. Um, yeah, she's, yeah. she's oh, asking. Yeah, sure. Thank you. It's nice having you here. <laughs> um, Janet Michaels with the city attorney's office and board and, and uh, trustees. You can't have a, a meeting unless it's been publicly noticed and it needs to be a public meeting. So you couldn't circulate a draft of something for people, for other trustees to review and provide comments on. That would have to be done during an open and publicly noticed meeting. So could we delegate a subcommittee to take an action? Yes. At this meeting? Yes. Okay, that sounds like the process we would need to follow. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the issue is the rest of the board won't have an opportunity to see what the subcommittee is doing. Um, a lot of times in these situations, board members might just speak on their own behalf and not as a member of the board. And that's certainly something that's available to all of the trustees that you could submit personal comments. Yeah, I, I just think this uh, particular issue uh, is so significant import that uh, a, a, a comment from the entire board would be warranted. And as a board, we've been acting on this property recently to try to improve the environmental conditions of it. So a threat to the environmental conditions is in keeping with ongoing business that we've been doing about this piece of property in my view. And it seems if you framed it that way, that it's prior decisions that the board has made, then, then you could speak on behalf of the entire board. Can you hear okay, Michelle, what's going on here in the room? Yes. Um, okay. uh, yeah, so I, I think what we're talking about is drafting a letter and delegating the two of you to say, the board, again, a general statement about the board has acted um, in ways to protect the adjacent open space and um, and are concerned about the development that's happening in the area. If it's it, as general as that, then I would be okay delegating the authority to do that tonight. If, well, if I, I would would. see I would see one other part to it, okay. which is uh, urgent urging the council to place constraints on any development they approve to continue to constrain the impacts on the marsh. For instance, sound, light, some of those kinds of things. And that's why knowing what staff has already requested is important. Yeah, I would see it as actually protecting uh, the marsh. Um, 
And I do think, Michelle, uh, certainly for many years, the open space department has worked with the Boulder Valley School District. Uh, you know, the facility, the Thorn Ecological uh, Center uh, building uh, was part of a cooperative effort uh, years ago and the ongoing educational activities are cooperative uh, with many involved participants. And I think the Open Space Board and the department have a real uh, vested interest in making sure that that area receives the protection it is warranted. And I don't disagree with you all. I just feel like I'm doing it very blindly. And I, if I, and, and I trust you both, but at the same time, if you're gonna put my name on it as a trustee, I would like to know what, yeah. what this is all about. Well, um, the other thing we could call a special meeting, you know, be, you know, a half an hour meeting and- uh, And do a public notice for right, it. Right, right. And it could be a Zoom meeting. Yeah. Are you okay with that, Are you, John and Michelle? I mean, I'd rather decide tonight one, <laughs> one way or the other, uh, personally. But um, you know, it it seems like they're likely to make a decision at the meeting so. on yeah. the seventeenth. It seems to me we're talking about three elements to this communique. A description of our past actions about this property as a board, our concerns about the current proposal, and a request regarding the need to protect it, the marsh going forward. And I think we'd have a paragraph for each one of those items. I mean, it, the marsh, Michelle, is a real community asset. I mean, it, it, it is yeah, very it's, rare that a, an area like that in an urban context uh, provides both the educational opportunities as well as the natural values. And, you know, to, to continue to erode uh, that um, at some point, it, it will cease to function. Is Janelle in this meeting? I can, I'm making her a pan, I'm making her a panelist right now. I'm wondering if she could give us a verbal description of the ways in which this area is used for education so that Michelle and John can hear a bit oh, about Yeah, that. I've been, I've been there and my kids have taken camps okay. there. So, so you have yeah, I'm, that. I, yeah, I'm very familiar with the, um, the, the educational okay. nature of it. I just don't know where this is and what's like, how far away it is and what's, what's proposed, um, but I would be open to, and sorry, John, this is maybe not what you wanted, but um, to looking at that packet and having a 30 minute Zoom meeting, if Dave and Karen, you think you could react to something and very quickly and draft something, and then we publicly notice a, a meeting for as early as Monday. I don't know if that involves a lot of staff or not, because we can do that ourselves, right? I don't know. Um, <laughs> 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 we can do that. We'll draft the <laughs> we'll, we'll draft the community. The, the council meeting is next Thursday, right? A week from tomorrow. So and I am flying out on Wednesday, it turns out, as I look at my calendar. <laughs> um, so I would say that we have to have our Zoom meeting by Monday or Tuesday. Can, can we get, uh, get it duly announced, publicly announced in that? Time yeah, what's the that? time frame that has to be publicly announced? To my five. five? No less than 24 hours. Okay, so we could still do that. If you, in the paper, it would have been today at five, but 24 hours, it could be on the website and it's okay to do it with just, just the website calendar. You the door out here, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, we can. Yes. <laughs> or on the website, which is even more obscure. So now don't go away. We want to hear your thoughts on the educational importance of sombrero marsh. A short paragraph would be fine. Well, yeah, and I was going to say I would want to. I would want Korea Rosado to be able to weigh in on that. Um, I know that she, you know, she just met with uh, Keith a couple of days ago. She's in communication. You know, she has a very strong partnership with Thorn um, to exactly what kind of programming um, is happening this year. I can speak to years ago, but I, 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 don't, I feel like that wouldn't be helpful. I'd rather wait for Curry to be able to give you all a, um, a more accurate update on that. What we would like to know, just so you know, for her, is kind of uh, the breadth of the programming, the number of kids, you know, kind of participating, um, you know, kind of how they use the marsh and the programming, and, and whether there are any current impacts that are, are either similar to the proposed ones or um, how they've dealt with uh, potential impacts uh, to the educational activities out there. Okay, great. Thank you. We'll get back to you. Thanks. Okay, so could I ask everybody to look at the, their calendars? And, yeah. um, and I open all, I'm open all day Monday, but have preference for to use my lunch break to do this. On Monday, you're saying? Yeah. John, what does your calendar look like Monday at noon? <laughs> Uh, generally, Do you have flexibility in moving your lunch hour a little before or a little after? Yeah, I mean, I don't really have to take a lunch hour. I just eat at my computer Yeah, that's and, read, and, read, and read the news. <laughs> <laughs> my lunch hour is very flexible, too. <laughs> we could do it in the evening, presumably, as well, right? Uh, I, I could do lunch. Okay. Monday. Tell me what time you're thinking lunch, Monday. So midday, anytime between 11 and 1. John, pick a time. Uh, I'm wide open in there. As name well. a, name a number for a half hour noon time meeting. Uh, noon. Noon. 12, 1230? 1230. 1230. 1230. 1230 okay. to 1. Okay. <clears throat> you might be flying solo without me. <clears throat> I'm going to be in a budget meeting. 12 to 230. Uh, is there one of your... Yeah, if, we did, uh, if we did 11, would you like to attend? Like, we're all going yeah, to be, we're all making final decisions on budget and personnel, yeah. Money, money, money. <clears throat> Is there any time Monday that would work for you? Um, we didn't hear it. It's an all-day budget meeting. Well, I know, but I know <laughs> what all-day meetings actually consist of. 3 to 3.30. 3 Three to three thirty. What well, what does that look like? Ten. Okay, for John. Can you do lunch at three, Michelle? <laughs> three to three thirty. Uh, yeah, I'll just do my usual. Ignore my kids after they come home from school, sort of thing. <laughs> okay, three this to is four. Them. <laughs> three to three thirty on Monday. And. So somebody, uh, I don't know who does this, Allison or Leah, can set up a Zoom meeting for 3 to 3.30. And one, one of you can do the announcement. Yeah, the announcement will just be on the city calendar on our website. Okay. And are we still doing that process of the letter will be drafted, circulated, and then Monday you're basically just approving the letter? Is that uh, no, we I will think. try to get it to to somebody, maybe to Allison, for circulation to the OSBT members by Monday morning. So you won't have it a day or two before. You'll have it the morning of. And Friday is the city Friday holiday. Friday is the city holiday. So yeah. holiday. So tomorrow. So tomorrow, <laughs> I'm getting the trustees the packet, uh, the council packet, which probably will be pretty comprehensive. Um, Curry will provide a description of educational programming and we will provide you uh, the subjects and content outline of city staff comments today, or OSMP, Grace for staff. 
Great. So we'll actually get a copy, before we go a in, copy of before the OSMP stat comments. Well, it depends. So sometimes when we're at meetings, it's it's verbal. But oh, we'll, so it might not be a memo of any kind. I'll, I'll have to see, okay. but it, it could be verbal in which we'll summarize them. Okay. Bullet points of what our Got comments it. were. Got it. That's Will not they be part of the <laughs> council package as well, the staff comments? Um, OSMP specific comments, I would guess not. Uh, so, but those are all things that we could get out to you before we leave for holiday. So that tomorrow. Would be tomorrow. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, and Allison, you're the one that's orchestrating the Zoom meeting. Is that right? Yeah, but Leah will coordinate. Leah is noticing. It. Yeah. Yeah. And she'll post the link and everything to the website. Um, the link, yes. So who will be available on Friday should we need you? On Friday? No, on, on Monday? <laughs> Friday's a holiday. <laughs> I know, but who will be available so that we can no. reach? <laughs> and it will just be, we're just talking Zoom, everyone from their own location, right? Right. No one come here. Right. right. <laughs> no, no, we're not doing it here. Okay. Okay, uh, it sounds to me like we've got a plan. And then at by, by 3.30 on Monday, we'll know what's going to happen at the 17th council meeting. As far as we're concerned. Yeah. And if we are, were to make a comment at the council meeting, do we need to uh, sign up, be an official... And when does that need to happen? You by Wednesday at five, usually, or something like that. Can one of you sign, get us on the list? I don't think that's how it works. But <laughs> how, how, how does, does it, it work? work? <laughs> it's a sign up process, and I think, I think it's a first come, first serve type of but process. But you could go on and just put OSBT as. Yeah, I might ask them what their preference is when it's coming from our, our board, but right. there is an online sign up ahead of time. I'll find out more specifics. <laughs> if there's a public comment, like agenda item for this at the meeting, like we should be able to have someone speak regardless. But if we have to right. sign up during open comment, it's a lottery, usually of like 20. Right. Yeah. Well, that's and that's the question that Leah said she'd ask is whether it since it's a board wanting to speak whether we have to get in the lottery and maybe not be allowed to speak or whether we could. Yeah, I, let's see if it's a public comment, we wanna know if they uh, provide opportunities for the board to officially speak. If it's a lottery I, in, and there's, that means there's no decision, then I don't think we ought to speak. But if it's not, if, but if it's not scheduled for public comment, then, well, they then can't we, make a decision without a public without a public comment. Well, but it seems like you might have the board might have some preferential treatment to speak about open space matters. So let me just find out more specifics. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> That's what we needed to hear. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank yeah. you, Janet. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's a public hearing. Did you hear that dance? Okay. <clears throat> Great. So thanks very much for all of you. To, uh, to, <laughs> for the cast of thousands. To, to help us out in this. I think this is really important and uh, it's worth the effort, but thanks very much. And thank you, Cindy and Alex, for bringing this to our attention and to Ed, who emailed us. Um, now, back to the agenda for tonight. Um, do we need to appoint a subcommittee to write something ahead of the discussion on Monday? I can do that as you'll, chair. You'll do it. I can. I oh, can you, say, you can appoint it. Okay. I can say there's a subcommittee of Dave and Karen, and we're going to draft something for the Monday 3 p.m. Okay. meeting. Right. Sounds good. Will, which which you which you will get Monday morning. Monday morning. Yeah. Or before. Sounds good. I just wanted because to make nobody sure. nobody will be in the office to forward it to you before Monday morning. Okay. Oh, that's it. But that's a good question. Who's going to do that forwarding? Do we send it to Ella, to Leah? Okay. I'm just not available in that afternoon time. I'm in it on Monday. Okay. And then you can review it at your leisure. 
on my lunch break. Yeah, yeah on your lunch break <laughs> at 12 o'clock <laughs> yeah. in preparation for great lesson. Great. Um, are there any other comments or questions about the public comments that were made before the meeting today? Um, no, sorry, one last thing is, can we make sure that Caroline knows that this is happening on Monday? Yes. And I could communicate directly with her about that, right? Okay. okay. And as far as uh, Dick Harris's comments on e-bikes, uh, I think our, our future conversation tonight will address uh, right. some of that. Yep. Uh, I just have one quick question about the written information that's attached to the packet about this public participation update memo. Mm -hmm. Is that some, a new thing that we'll be getting quarterly? Yeah, I quarterly? used to. It's an old thing. It's old. Uh, <laughs> it was an old thing that's coming back. We, uh, oh. And when COVID hit, I believe we dropped it because there wasn't a lot of public in yeah, yeah. And now at the retreat, it was suggested that we pick it back up. So Allison took the ball and you your first re next edition of it. Got it. Okay. So we'll be getting it for Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> okay. I think we're ready to go on to agenda item 3B. And you've got a note about uh, 3B, and I'm hoping we can rapidly uh, conclude our discussion and finish up the rules and procedures. And, uh, and the summary notes from the retreat. Uh, in the copy that you have in this packet for this board meeting, uh, there are two quick revisions on what we've already done, I believe that need to be made on page three. So if you'd all turn to page three for agenda item 3B. Which document are you on, Karen? Um, the notes or the rules? The rules. The rules. Yeah, the rules. On 3B, Article 2, Number 7, and Article 3, Number 4, as I read them, are duplicates. Two, seven, and three, four. <clears throat> and if you all agree, I would propose that we delete two, seven, since three, four has a little bit of extra information. Um, <clears throat> it, would it make sense to add the words meeting agenda into three, four somewhere? Because it doesn't actually explicitly say meeting agenda three, four? It's a bit pedantic, but. Um, oh, staff uh, shall make a reasonable effort to submit detailed reports. Does it in, Including a meeting agenda. Yes, I, I think if we add that, that's a reasonable change. Because a meeting agenda is mentioned in two, seven, but not in three, four. Okay. And. Wait a second. I, I thought you were actually suggesting the title of part of three. Oh, oh, yes. It was add meeting agenda to three, four, so, somewhere in there. In the text yeah. under number four. But not make it the official title of the article? Correct. Yes. Why wouldn't you want it to be? I, I, it could be the title of the article as well. Um, uh, because it strikes me that 
that is I would most propose, informative. I would propose that it be changed to agendas plural because number five talks about field trips. Which are also, as opposed to meetings. Which would also be a, uh, yeah, I think the plural would be fine for the title. So we're changing article not Roman number three to the titled agendas plural. And we're changing number four under three to six <clears throat> staff shall make reasonable effort to submit detailed reports, including meeting agendas and information concerning agenda topics to the board members at least five days prior to the meeting. Right? Karen, say that after including meeting agendas and before concern. and information. And then going back to the topics concerning blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And then deleting number seven above, number Roman numeral two, seven, deleting that all together. Is that okay? Yes. Michelle, are you with us? Okay. Seven yes. And then at the very bottom of the page, there's a consistency issue, I think, because if you look at, at Roman numeral three, six, and then Roman numeral three, seven, three, seven says changes to the agenda or the calendar and reasons for those changes will be provided to the board by the director as expeditiously as possible. And so I believe on six before that, it needs to say in the last sentence, if there are changes to this calendar, a one month notice will be provided to the board by the chair and or director. Because if the director is the one who's making changes, he needs to be mentioned in six as well as seven. Seems reasonable. Okay. So Leah, in that article, I think wherever the word agenda occurs, it should be plural. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And then I think the last item that we need to deal with in this set of rules is roll numeral six. Number three. No. It's the interest of numbers. And I'm assuming, um, Leah, that that where two is crossed out should be changed to three. That's correct. Anytime board members express an issue will be number three. Thanks. And where's my revision? I have notes on my packet from last time. We had right revised wording for this, and I don't, I can't tell you whether we talked about it or not. So you all are going to have to tell me. Which section? <clears throat> numeral six, number three. Hmm. Instead of what's typed there now in red, what my handwritten notes say is. Anytime board members express personal opinion to the media about topics the board is addressing, they should make clear that such opinion is a personal perspective and, and not, does not represent the views of the rest of the board. Did we talk about that last time? Oh, I, I don't, don't recall that. I think maybe I what either. I know we <clears throat> we didn't conclude our all of our going through this, so right. it might have been your notes of what you wanted to raise, and we just didn't get to it. Okay, that's what I'm wondering. Is whether that's the case or whether we talked about it. So if you if we didn't talk about it, then it's just my notes. 
So I guess I'd like to propose that that revision to Roman Roman numeral six, number three, be considered. And Karen, I, I, I stopped because I wasn't sure if we were adding it. So anytime board members express a personal opinion to the media, and that's where I stopped. About topics the board is addressing, which is what it says there now. Uh oh. <laughs> Ignore that. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um, comma, they should make clear that such opinion is a personal perspective and does not represent the views of the rest of the board. And I'm suggesting that that sentence, yeah, replace what Aaliyah has just highlighted. Whoops, and delete. Sorry, it's back. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it there for now. <laughs> so I think when we originally talked about this last year, um, we were really talking about um, more than one person um, talking to the media or writing a letter, and they are two board members, um, but saying, stating that they were speaking on behalf of the, their own personal perspective, given that it is actually a topic that the board is taking up, um, didn't seem to really address the fact that well, yeah, two people could have the same opinion on the board, and they're they're saying that they're they're speaking um, on behalf of their own personal opinions. But the fact is, there are only five members of the board, so it looks like um, even though the words say you're speaking as individuals, it's forty percent of the board saying, "Oh, well, we're not talking about we're not speaking on behalf of the board," even though this is business that the board is undertaking. It. That's my recollection of what we were trying to address when we were talking about being mindful that there are only five members of the board. So, so I, striking I, that kind of loses that spirit of, okay, it's not a rule. Certainly two people can you know, write about whatever they want and say that it's their personal opinion, but we're just asking, be mindful that we are only a five person board. So I have an, an additional sentence, Michelle, that I, I'm going to propose that I hope addresses that. And the proposed sentence is, opinions expressed by individual board members should be carefully considered given that the board consists of only five members. Or, we can take out the word only this the board consists of five members. And does that uh, by individual board members, if does that address two people writing uh, a letter together? Yeah, good. By um, one or two board members or whatever that is. We just remove the word individual. Okay, yeah. Uh, how about and how about putting the S after board members in parentheses? There you go. There you go. Yeah. Yep. I like that, Dave. Okay. And we can get, we can have, let Leah delete the next one that she's been trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> go, Leah. <laughs> okay. Are we all happy with three? You want to read it over? Your hand. <laughs> <laughs> so number one of Jack. <laughs> Dave, are you happy? I am really delighted. Yeah, sounds good. Leah, you might want to get rid of the second three. I I uh, oh, okay. I will. Sorry, it's the trap format. Uh, thank you though. Uh, and the only other thing on my copy of the oh, the rules is the uh, section about adoption. And I don't think we have any changes to make on that, except for the yellow highlighted version <laughs> of the day, which Leah will, in her most efficient way, revise. We're just one day off. From the board. That's right. Well, you know, you could go back a year, though. 
Are we time traveling? <laughs> no, we're not doing that tonight. We're already too late. You're a day off and a year off. It is. <laughs> okay, I take it back. Okay. Um, I'd like to hear a motion that we uh, approve the revised rules so that we do this officially and have a motion. I so, second. I'll second. Michelle second. All the is a favor in favor of approving the revised rules of procedure for the Open Space Board of Trustees. Um, oh, I have to go through the names. Michelle? Yes. John? Yes. Dave? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I'd like to go through the summary of the uh, summary notes from the retreat the same way that we do with minutes page by page, and if you have any revisions to make, please let us all know. Um, on page one of agenda item 3B, retreat summary notes. On the third paragraph from the bottom, right in the middle of that paragraph, it says you can see the difference in species richness. And it needs to be changed from different to different CE. You see that the paragraph that starts staff discuss the Lindsay property. Thank you. You can see the difference in species richness. Yeah, tiny little typo. Anything else on page one from the retreat summary notes? No. No. Okay, page two, meaning summary notes. Really roaring through this. Uh, in line four, the uh, track changes shows tall oak grass so that Zurich should say tall grass and delete the oat in that fourth line. So that it just says Zurich tall grass is not displaced. Is there anything else? Yeah. Well, in the, oh, no, I'm just looking at that now. Uh, we have the actually the tall grass shouldn't be capitalized. It should be lowercase. lowercase so Zurich, both Zurich and so X and T should be lowercase okay. because it includes uh, yep. a number of species. Yeah. Okay, anything else on page two? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, Leon, or Dan, I guess I'll pose this to you. Mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful unless you have uh, strenuous objections to include the staff list of items uh, identified, you know, for calendar. the calendar for the coming year in the, yeah, that, in the, meeting the retreat meeting notes so that that list because we refer to that yeah. but we don't ever say what it is and it, so it's inconclusive as far as we can see that you know what the board then did in addition to that but we never saw we never see that mark a heavily marked draft so that when it gets revised in the future yeah. it's was it, was it part of the it original packet that one okay. the packet. because this has been changed i've updated to include all these materials so but we'll include the original one sure yeah it's kind of well it's up to you on how you want to no, normally these notes are more internal use versus posted how we would do minutes so kind of up to you on how you want to include it but I would rather include the original ones rather than the updated one because the updated one now has all the suggestions in here. So I think that would be fine. I think internally, though, it's it's That's useful smart. so that we sure. can kind of see, okay, what's kind of what, okay. what did we work from and then what did we add? Sure. So, Leah, once these are finalized, we'll include that as a back page or attachment chart. Okay. Okay. Anything else on page two? Okay, moving on to page three. Um, my notes show that there was one other thing in the top paragraph, line three at the top of page three. Um, there was also interest in a field trip on regional connections, parentheses, Lippincott and Trails, 
and on a roundtable study session with staff. which is the only thing from the previous photograph that's not included in this text. So I thought it was important to include that. Okay. Anything else on page three? Looking at that, I think uh, just so we're all clear, maybe put the word property after lip and cot, uh, because some people might not Shorthand. know what lip and yeah. cot actually is. Okay, are we ready for page four? I just have a question on page four. On the second bullet, it's, it's, it's about our, our discussions of permits. And I'm wondering if this list is also going to include commercial permits in addition to off trail permits. Or is, is commercial permits part of what's included in the report on permits? Yeah. You're talking about the annual revenues and tax and sales? Well, it doesn't say that. It okay. says staff discussed updating a report on permits that have been issued. Okay. And then it says staff will pull together something similar to what we did two years ago, but, but yeah. to also include off trail permits. Yes. Um, so that'd be commercial and special use facility reservations, annual and daily parking permits, woodlot, and then you added off trail. So what we what we provided last time was here here were the revenues for each program, and then the number of permits that we sold. So we would do that for each program, and then when we provided it last time, we did a ten year look back. So we would just be updating uh, for 2022's numbers. Okay. Short answer, yes, commercial use. <laughs> um, okay, great. Anything else on page four? I didn't type anything extra for that bullet point. Okay. I was just <laughs> plumbing the <laughs> Yes. <laughs> that was a good clarification. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, no problem. Okay, any other revisions? for the retreat summary notes. Okay. Um, do we approve these like minutes? No, we just let them stand as written. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to agenda item four. And at this point, we are about a half hour later than the schedule. Okay. But well, here we are. But here we are. Right so <clears throat> tonight we have <laughs> one item for matters from the board, and that's to begin our trilogy. I think someone else had, uh, oh, no, that was trilogy. Trilogy. I'll have to think of it for the people, but <clears throat> just, to, uh, just to remind the board and any uh, folks listening in, uh, there's been some changes in the sequencing and uh, dates for our upcoming and current, to, uh, including tonight, our uh, e-bike discussion. <clears throat> so we have uh, broken it down into three meetings, uh, November, our December OSBT meeting and our January OSBT meeting. Uh, tonight's focus uh, on our e-bike evaluation pro uh, process and project is going to be concentrated heavily on our uh, uh, the community and public engagement efforts that we did this summer and the results of that. So we'll have uh, uh, a presentation that will focus in on uh, the engagement aspect. We will also, uh, also in the memo, <clears throat> and we'll touch upon in the presentation will be some further staff analysis <clears throat> that was done uh, uh, since the July meeting that we met with you to uh, talk about e-bikes. And that uh, will also um, uh, daylight uh, a, a current and draft uh, preliminary recommendation uh, at, at this point. And this is all leading to the December meeting in which we'll have a final staff recommendation. And at that final staff recommendation, we'll have a, another staff presentation 
will entertain clarifying questions from the trustees on, on the presentation and uh, the staff memo. And then we will uh, proceed to open it up for a public hearing in which we'll get feedback and hear from community members. Um, and at that point, that meeting will conclude um, and uh, we'll reconvene uh, that, uh, that subject matter at the January OSBT meeting. And we'll move into the board discussion and deliberation portion of, uh, of this sequence. <clears throat> it's anticipated that at that meeting, the board will uh, develop and make a recommendation to council on, on board's recommendation regarding uh, the e-bike uh, 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 project. So again, three, three steps. Uh, what we're hoping for tonight, uh, and Marty will outline it in just a minute, but one of the main asks of the trustees at this meeting is that if you feel like there's gaps in information or clarity in information needs or uh, any additional information that you all feel you need to move into that December, January uh, uh, subject matters and to, and to support your development of a recommendation, we would love to hear that tonight um, if you have that uh, so we can get to work on uh, 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 making uh, making that final list of other additional information that is being requested. So just keep kind of keep that in mind that that is one of the staff asks of the board for tonight is uh, do you all have any other additional information that you would like? And we are going to be Casey, I believe is going to be doing the main documentation of kind of hearing what uh, what those needs might be. We also received uh, some email uh, requests over the past few days. That is already started on this list that we're developing. So uh, just wanted to set that context. And with that, I'm going to introduce Marty Rathratzel, our principal planner, who will lead us through tonight's presentation. Thank you. All right. Well, good evening, um, Open Space Board of Trustees. As Dan said, I'm Marty Ratzel, uh, OSMP principal planner. Um, and I've been the project manager for the evaluation of e-bikes on Open Space. Um, excuse me, Allison. Yes. Can you sort of scoop that right column further to the right so that we can see the whole? And keep in mind that your camera's on, right? My camera is on, but you can't see me for some. Reason. Oh, that's perfect. Thanks. Oh, that. Okay. Marty, oh. it'll probably switch once you've been talking for a second. Yeah, oh, Marty. Well, that's not true because normally it goes off the sound from your. Well, I see you on in okay, my. Okay, you can see me. Yeah, so people at home can see you too. That sounds good. Okay, so I think we're all set up now. <clears throat> I can't move any of that stuff at the top. It's okay though, right? You all can let me know. It's fine. Okay, so my presentation will provide some background information most of which was shared as part of previous updates to the board in May and July. And then I'll share some key findings from the community input, um, as well as additional staff analysis that we've done since we last presented to the board that has helped the, the department identify a preliminary staff recommendation. Okay, so starting with background, little bit of a delay. Uh, the evaluation to consider e-biking on open space is related to a few strategies in, uh, from the master plan. Um, and as you can see those here, there's one uh, strategy in each tier of the implementation plan of the master plan. Uh, these include assessing and managing increasing visitation, encouraging multimodal access to trailheads, and supporting a range of passive recreation experiences. Uh, Dan covered a lot of this, so I'll, um, uh, but I'll, I'll reiterate. Uh, OSMP first started, uh, we first updated the board on the emerging needs and commitments related to e-biking um, back in 2018. The evaluation was delayed due to the pandemic, and we began an evaluation of alternatives in the spring of 2022. Um, then we hosted a community engagement window over the summer. So that brings us to where we are today. Uh, this meeting's the first of three uh, in three steps for the OSBT to consider a staff recommendation. Um, as Dan mentioned, 
Um, one of the primary objectives of tonight is to make sure you have the information needed to consider a final staff recommendation over the course of the next two meetings in December and January. Uh, December will be coming back with, a, um, with, the, with the board hosting a public hearing. Uh, and then we'll return uh, in the new year in January for you to um, have your discussion and consider the staff recommendation and to provide a, the city council with the board's recommendation. We, uh, what you're seeing here uh, are the many work groups that, are, uh, that have been assembled for this robust interdisciplinary project. Um, this team has provided input throughout the planning and evaluation process. So current city policy prohibits e-bikes on open space trails with the exception of those people that are experiencing disabilities and they can use them as an OPDMD to be quizzed on the acronym slender. Um, if e-bikes are envisioned, uh, are an envisioned use on trails, uh, the land managed by OSMP requires it to be disposed of to, to another public agency. So our neighboring land managers now allow some e-bikes on their open space natural surface trails. Both Boulder County, I'm sorry, Boulder County allows both class one and class two e-bikes on their parks and open space trails in the plains. Jefferson County allows class one e-bikes on natural surface trails and class two on their concrete trails. Um, and uh, similar to Jefferson County, US Fish and Wildlife Service allows class one e-bikes on non-motorized trails within Rocky Mountain National Wildlife Refuge. What does this mean for us on a regional scale? There's some inconsistency in regulations between our trails on OSMP uh, and those managed by adjacent land managers. <laughs> that has created some uh, operational challenges which prompted our review. Uh, so there are several trails and this is an example, I presented this back in July as well. The trails that are in red on this map are on open space land managed by open space and mountain parks, and the green trails uh, on the map are not. Um, those trails allow e-bikes. Um, so you're seeing some of the um, visitor compliance issues that we've heard about and that affect visitor experience. Uh, OSMP rangers have observed an increase of e-bike use on our managed trails. And we also have seen an uptick in community inquiries requesting a review <coughs> that we're working on now. So, uh, as I mentioned back in the spring, we began the evaluation and staff identified three alternatives to evaluate and consider that would allow uh, e-bikes on open space. Alternative A, see if I can, there we go. So alternative A would allow e-bikes on all trails that allow biking. Represents about 35% of OSMP's trail network. Alternative B would allow e-bikes on Plains Trails and the Boulder Canyon Trail. That represents about 22% of the trails on OSMP. And alternative C would allow e-bikes on interconnected multi-use trails that allow bikes. That's about 16% of the total network. So beginning last spring, or actually I should say it last spring, staff evaluated these three management alternatives against one another. The rating scale is a gradient from most to least in terms of meeting the criteria assessed that you see on, on the screen. Uh, it informed the selection of a preliminary proposal of alternative B which was Plains Trails and the Boulder Canyon Trail. Uh, and having alternative B uh, is the, has the most advantages. So we shared the alternatives and, a, uh, and alternative B as the preliminary proposal uh, for community input during the engagement window over the summer. Okay, so uh, we began our community input in July and at that time, uh, we came to the board. We had just begun the window, uh, the engagement window, and we're beginning to hear from our community members. 
So the next part of the presentation is new information from, uh, from the board. Um, it was also included in your packet. And I'll start with the results of the community input that we gathered. So we gathered community input using two different survey instruments. And this presents uh, the information about these two data sets. There's an online engagement questionnaire, which provided community members with an open participation opportunity to provide feedback. Additionally, um, our Human Dimensions team conducted an on-site intercept survey at a subset of open space trails. The engagement, uh, the online engagement questionnaire was hosted on the Be Heard Boulder uh, webpage. And it was publicized as a forum for providing input on the department's evaluation and consideration of whether to allow e-bikes on trails. We had over 2,300 people complete a questionnaire. Uh, and um, in terms of it being open participation, that means that respondents self-select to take the survey uh, and generally have an interest in the, the topic at hand um, of e-bikes. Conversely, the, in, the on-site intercept survey, um, as I mentioned, was conducted by our human dimensions team. And they use the same methodology as our visitor surveys that we do on, a, um, on an ongoing basis. Um, I'll give you a little bit of information on that. So the trail users were stopped as they were leaving a trailhead location and asked to answer questions and gather their opinions about e-biking. Uh, you can see that the sample size is smaller, but it is a randomized sample, um, meaning that those who were intercepted and asked to take the survey didn't have a predetermined interest in sharing their opinions about e-biking. They didn't know that we were going to be out there asking those questions. Um, so it, th these results can be generalized to the population of visitors who recreate on our city open space lands. And they can also be compared to future intercept surveys to gather information about trends. So um, I'm bookending my, uh, the input that I'm, the results uh, by sharing with you the key findings. Um, so overall, the community input does indicate that there's community support for e-biking on open space. And what you'll see in the slides I'm about to present are that most of the online engagement respondents support alternative B. And um, there was support across all three alternatives by many of the on-site intercept respondents. Uh, I'm going to walk through uh, a lot of the data. And again, it's also in your packet if you want, if you have any questions on those. So starting with just um, the distribution of responses of where people live, the highest percentage of respondents for both surveys were, um, are from the city of Boulder residents, as well as those that live in Boulder County. And most of the respondents indicated hiking or biking as their primary activity on open space. You can see there's a higher proportion of respondents to the online engagement um, that indicated biking as a primary activity than those who were intercepted um, on site. And I think that makes sense given that the topic um, is about e uh, a policy regarding e biking. So what you're seeing here is that overall, a majority of respondents from each survey support e-biking on open space in some form over the status quo of uh, not allowing e-bikes on open space. 72% of respondents to the online engagement and 63% of the on-site intercept uh, respondents indicated support for e-biking. We, uh, the staff also analyzed support by several de demographic variables um, that you're seeing here. And a breakout of these respondent demographics is included in your packet. Uh, the results indicated very similar trends to the overall support of e-biking, um, with the exception of familiarity of e-bikes. There was variation between subgroups for those that um, 
for e-bike ownership and ridership. So taking a look at that, um, e-bike ownership and ridership were strong indicators of support, whether from owning or simply having ridden an e-bike. Respondents who are more familiar with e-bikes were significantly more supportive of e-biking on open space. That said, I think it's also worth noting that respondents who don't own an e-bike or haven't ridden still showed significant support for e-biking over uh, the status quo. Uh, you can see that the only time between the two surveys where there's a slight majority that pre would prefer the status quo is a subgroup of people who have not ridden an e-bike. Um, and I think that's from the engagement questionnaire. Um, that in and of itself is, uh, does represent a minority of respondents. And is that shown on this slide? Yeah, so let's see if I can. One of the challenges of having a screen and keeping my notes is I can't use my pointer. So um, uh, those that have not written, so under the online engagement. Um, oh, under, I see it's the, brown, it's the brown exactly. bar. Got it, okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, next, we analyze support by management alternatives. So reminding you what those are, um, A, B, and C. For the online engagement, uh, most respondents who supported e-biking selected the default option of alternative B. Um, that was pre presented as the preliminary staff proposal. For the on-site intercept uh, survey, respondent preferences were more evenly split among the three e-biking alternatives um, with a slightly higher percentage of respondents preferring alternative A. The engagement or the on online engagement also asked respondents to select the top three reasons in support of their preference. Okay, come on, it's taking a long time. There we go. <laughs> Being, um, so those that prefer alternative A indicated that it provides the most access for people with different abilities as well as an aging population. They also express their opinion that e-bikes should be allowed everywhere traditional bikes should be allowed. For alternative B, uh, those who expressed a preference there uh, said that it increases access, and that was a primary reason, along with um, the, they also believe that it would reduce trips by car. And for those who chose alternative C, um, their top three reasons indicated that they do have some concern for visitor conflicts and safety and displacement of other visitors, but they still support e-biking on regional and interconnected trails. For those who prefer the status quo, um, the top three reasons expressed were e-biker speed and visitor conflict. Um, their reasons were a little bit more evenly distributed among um, concerns as well. Um, they did state as number two that um, they do not agree that the electric assist is non-motorized. That ranked second. Okay, so for the intercept survey, respondents were um, asked a range uh, what they, they were asked these two questions and um, asked what the likelihood of each outcome and to what degree that they are concerned about these items. Um, and what the findings demonstrated is that in general, concerns were lower among those who prefer alternative A, which is allowing e-bikes on the most number of trails. And they were, and the concerns were highest among those who prefer no change or the status quo. The same pattern was generally observed for the likelihood of outcomes, where those who preferred alternative A indicated that on average, they believe the likelihood of positive outcomes was higher, and the likelihood of negative outcomes was lower. And that pattern is changed or reversed um, for those respondents who preferred the no change or status quo. 
So what you're seeing here in terms of the bars and the colors there, um, these are uh, static results of the on-site intercept uh, responses. Uh, I wanna point out that the on-site intercept results are available as an interactive digital report on the project webpage. Um, and I also have Colin Leslie here uh, from our HD, our human dimensions team, um, if, if you have questions or wanted some more of a demonstration of that. The on-site intercept uh, also included a question that asked respondents to indicate their level of support for each alternative under consideration. So they were asked, um, you know, what level of support do you have for alternative A, for alternative B, for alternative C? So what this shows is that those that support A would also support alternative B and alternative C, but that it does go down um, a bit, whereas those that support B might not also support A, and those that support C might not also support B and A. So in addition to the on, uh, online engagement uh, and on-site intercept surveys, staff hosted two in-person sessions during office hours at the um, OSMP headquarters at the hub for community members to talk one-on-one -on -one with project team members. Um, and we also were available to offer help for the engagement, um, for completing the on, uh, online engagement. Pretty sure everybody that came had already um, completed it and they wanted to just talk more and learn more. Um, but input gathered throughout, you know, through the diff through the different means of the um, of the engagement window were um, basically led to a compendium of public comments. Um, and we identified a few themes uh, that you're seeing here. So concern for safety user concern for safety uh, for user conflicts and also for e-biking speed. Um, and for those that support e-biking on open space, there also was support for um, considering uh, a speed limit or, or enforcing a speed limit for e-bikes and probably bikes in general. So as I said, I was gonna bookend. And so the overall conclusion from uh, the two data sets is that um, there is support for uh, e-biking. And um, again, most of the uh, online engagement demonstrated support for alternative B. Um, and there was support across the boards for all the alternatives um, for the on-site intercept. And then our management considerations, I'll talk a little bit more about later. Okay, so the additional staff analysis that uh, has been completed, um, the evaluation of e-bikes on open space is, is being considered within the context of the Boulder City Charter. The charter identifies passive recreation as an open space purpose. Um, it does, you know, the charter limits the use of open space and passive recreation is one of those um, those purposes. The charter provides examples of passive recreation uses, including if, if specifically designated bicycling. But the charter does not define all passive recreational uses. It provides examples of uh, it provides examples of use um, with the phrase such as, and it's not unusual to find gaps in the charter. As an organic document, it's it is not intended to anticipate every possible circumstance. So city council regularly adopts ordinances to create processes that implements the intent of the charter. In terms of council's role with respect to passive recreation, council is not delegated this charter term. So it's within the authority of city council to define passive recreational uses on open space property. The 2005 Visitor Master Plan is a council approved policy document. Uh, and the VMP, as we call it, includes a definition of passive recreation as non motorized activities that achieve a set of criteria to guide the activity's compatibility with other open space uses. A 
As part of our evaluation, OSMP staff determined that with the exception of the non-motorized component of the definition, e-biking is compatible with the passive recreation definition and um, in particular is uh, compatible with the criteria in the BMP. Um, as such, uh, e-biking is an activity that the department could manage like biking. So um, another update is that we've reached out to our peer agencies that are allowing e-bikes. And uh, each of those, I had mentioned them earlier, Boulder County, um, Jeff Jefferson County, um, and the city transportation in particular. Um, they each indicated that biking, e-biking hasn't resulted in any safety or visitor concerns. Most peer agencies provided antidotal information, uh, which is included in, your, um, in the staff memo in the packet. And they shared that they didn't um, conduct any formal studies. So you know, they um, told us what, what they've learned so far. Uh, on the right side of the screen, um, I'd like to uh, present that Boulder County did conduct some speed observation, a speed observation study as part of the pilot project that they, um, that they hosted before the Board of County Commissioners finalized the policy to allow e biking. So what you're seeing here is that it recorded speeds of both conventional and e-assist bikes. And the results found that the average e-bike speed is pretty similar to a conventional bike, but it does vary based on terrain. Uh, while e-bike speed remained pretty consistent, whether going uphill or downhill, conventional bikes were recorded slower going uphill and faster going downhill. Um, since, e -bike, since they've allowed e-biking, our community partners, um, our peer agencies, um, uh, based on their observations thus far, they have not prioritized the need for more formal studies or data collection. Drawing from our own experience, um, biking is an, is an approved passive recreation activity that represents uh, about uh, nine, I think it was eight, eight or nine to 11 percent of all visitors on our lands. Um, of the respondents to the 2016-2017 visitor survey, six percent on average um, of of those that were surveyed reported a conflict with other users on the day of the survey. About a third of those indicated a conflict was with a, with a bike ride. So that means that on average, 2% of visitors reported conflict with a biker and 98% did not on the day of the survey. Uh, there's very little difference in average daily conflict between trails that allow cycling and trails that do not. Uh, overall, average daily conflict rate um, between or on OSMP trails has ranged between five and seven percent for close to two decades. And drawing from our experience and our evaluation, OSMP staff does not anticipate that allowing e-biking on existing bike trails would result in a significant change in conflict or safety-related concerns. The staff analysis also considered the approach for authorizing e-biking on open space. Uh, staff recognizes that there could be some debate about the interpretation of the electric battery of an e-bike as meeting the intent of a non-motorized activity. Based on uh, our determination that e-biking meets the criteria included in the visitor master plan for passive recreational activities, um, and that it could that e-biking could be managed like bikes on open space. It's possible for uh, council to make a legislative determination that uh, I'm sorry, a legislative determination by council could be made to allow e-bike use on trails as long as the activity meets the criteria contained in the definition of passive recreation, and that the trail is designated for e-biking use. To do that, council could approve rulemaking authority of the city manager to designate which trails are appropriate for e-biking. Uh, having the city manager uh, rulemaking authority would 
uh, or could require a rule amendment, uh, any future rule amendment would, uh, would require a new rule to designate any tracks. So there's that checks and balances. So if e-biking um, is supportive as a passive recreational use, uh, OSMP also considered um, how we would manage this on our, on our lands. And we recommend a holistic approach to manage e-biking like biking. Uh, taking a, a, a closer look at each of those areas um, for trail design and maintenance, there is significant guidance in trail design standards um, and maintenance that can support speed and conflict mitigation on multi-use trails. A focus, um, if e-bikes were allowed, would be to review requests strategically to prioritize pinch points along trails that would allow e -biking. In terms of education and outreach, um, our staff provide a variety of engaging and informative programs, events, and experience for a diversity of audiences. Raising awareness and supporting visitors to know the rules is an effective strategy that we would continue and we would enhance if e-biking were allowed on some multi-use trails to help people know where they're allowed, as well as increase awareness of the yield triangle and the understanding of trail courtesy. In terms of enforcement, um, our rangers would continue to focus on highly visited areas and targeted patrols are a tool that can be used to address visitor safety concerns or complaints where e-biking would be allowed. In terms of monitoring, uh, e-biking would be added as a new activity category for our future visitor surveys alongside with all the other allowed activities. And that would allow staff to quantify and detect any change in activity distributions over time as part of system-wide monitoring efforts. So arriving at our preliminary staff recommendation, um, based on the evaluation of the altern management alternatives, the community input, and the additional staff analysis, um, OSMP staff recommends a preliminary, um, our preliminary staff recommendation is to allow class one and class two e-biking as a passive recreational activity permissible on open space lands, um, allowed only on certain trails designated. The public input indicates that there's a majority of support uh, for authorizing e-biking as a passive recreational use. And um, as mentioned, it would not require a charter amendment. If the staff recommendation is approved, the department would intend to manage e-biking use on trails identified in alternative B, uh, those being the Plains trails that allow biking and the Boulder Canyon Trail. Staff identified alternative B as the preferred alternative because it best reflects community input and the findings of the alternatives uh, analysis in terms of how to manage e-biking. Um, with a number of uh, you know, a number of benefits. So providing a consistent visitor experience across interconnected trails uh, with both Boulder County and other city trails. In terms of regulation, um, the boundary of Broadway and Colorado uh, uh, 93 and North Foothills is a good dividing line to help our community understand the difference between Foothills trails that wouldn't allow e-bikes and Plains trails that would allow e-bikes. Uh, it's a pretty good uh, geographic boundary. Um, this alternative also increases opportunities for visitors experiencing disabilities and those with mobility challenges and our aging population. Uh, to help them experience or to continue experiencing Boulder's open space network. And uh, e-biking also could increase the percent of visitors who arrive to open space trails by bike and may contribute to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions typically caused by motor vehicles. So um, 
next month, the staff will return to the board with any additional information that you need to consider a final recommendation. And um, a public hearing will occur to invite community members to provide testimony on that final staff recommendation. Uh, and then in January, we come back for your consideration uh, and a recommendation to council. So to kick off tonight's discussion, we have three questions um, suggested for the board. Uh, do trustees have comments or questions about the community input? Do trustees have comments or questions about the additional staff analysis? Uh, and is there any additional information that the trustees need to consider an action item next beginning next month regarding e-bikes on open space? Uh, I'll just, before I open up the floor, I'd like to remind the board that uh, it's really between the now and the December meeting that staff would seek to pull together the additional information requests so that we have a final recommendation ready and packaged for next month. Um, and I think I could keep this up. I mean, I could give you that thank you slide, but you know, I think I'm... <laughs> Oh, I like the thing. <laughs> Leave the questions up to the foundation. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. I'd like to take a, like a five minute break before we start on the board discussion of all this. And um, obviously, we've, we've, reviewed uh, in visually the staff memo information as well as some additional data uh, that Marnie has presented. And so when we come back, what we'll be doing is discussing additional questions that we have or uh, perceptions, ideas that we have um, and, and the data that we need to ground our deliberations and decisions coming up in December and January. So um, let's agree on five minutes that we'll be back. And at that point, we'll start that discussion with board members. Okay? You come first. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's done. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Uh, we have about, uh, what is it, an hour and a half or so <laughs> scheduled for this discussion. And to give it some structure so that we don't bounce to and fro around this whole topic for the hour and a half, um, I'd like to suggest that we start with questions about the surveys and the survey data and spend about a half hour on that. And then look at the issues that we feel as board members we need to address and then end with a segment of time devoted to what we want staff to prepare for December. Um, and if that's okay with everybody, I'd like to start by focusing in on the difference between the online survey and the on-site intercept survey. Um, because in my experience in public input and the use of those two different types of surveys. I've heard many um, survey professionals, both who serve as consultants to the city and from within the city, say that when you have an online survey, um, that's not valid as, as Marnie's diagram on the first or second page of the second page of the PowerPoint slides in our packet show that that kind of input is is very biased and cannot be used is not generalizable and cannot be used for trends analysis. Um, so my experience is that the proper use of that kind of survey input is for the topics that are provided by the survey respondents. And I'd like to hear a little bit from um, 
I guess from Colin, about the distinction between the online survey and the intercept um, on-site survey and the use of data from those two different sources. Sure. <clears throat> I realize I'm supposed to turn on my camera. Right? Yeah, be good. Um, yeah, so I think I, I think a couple of the points you brought up um, are correct in the distinctions between how you can generalize the data. I don't think I use the term invalid necessarily because the validity really comes from the application you're trying to use it for. So sort of in terms of it being representative and generalizable to a larger population, that is difficult to know with an open participation survey like that. But those types of open participation formats do tend to provide is a, a, a way to capture sort of the range of opinions that are out there. Um, which in a lot of the open-ended responses that, that Marty went through as well. So being able to understand the diversity of, of range of, of opinions that are out there and by mirroring a number of the questions across the two surveys, we can sort of help to understand that range of opinions from the on-site survey and use the, or sorry, from the online survey and use the on-site survey to give some context to the free mm -hmm. that exists. Colin, so, I have a question. I, I recently took a survey for um, transportation as a as a worker in in uh, Boulder, and it seems, and I, I don't remember what the format was, but it seemed the structure seemed very similar. Um, they were basically trying to say how how did you get to work today? How many times did you? Um, take the bus or did you run errands during the day? But that's that idea of like self-selecting into a survey, that that's kind of always true when you're talking about anything that's online survey and meant to, I, I guess, meant to um, get opinions on a broader basis. Is that true? A true statement? I mean, when I took that survey, it was really long, by the way, the, the transportation one. I, I almost quit many times. Um, and so I don't know who designed it. Sorry if I you're listening to me. <laughs> but, but it seemed like that it was this that whole idea of self, although they did target us because they knew we worked um, in that particular awful office park, I suppose. But 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 you you kind of self-select into that kind of survey. That's just kind of the nature of online surveys. Is that right? Depends on, on how the recruitment is happening for the online survey. Um, there are ways to, to recruit participants from within sort of a known group. There are some other methods that people can use to try and help calibrate and see if they've got representation across demographics, that's actually some of um, what we did with the online survey as well, is seeing what is the distribution across some of those different demographic measures, and how does that, uh, what are the similarities, what are the differences uh, between, uh, between the two demographic, between the demographics of the two surveys and in relation to other survey work that we have done in the past. So, not always perfect ways to calibrate it, but some ways to certainly give some checks to, to see how it compares. Well, and I'm, I must say that I, I have great reservations uh, about the, uh, the data from both surveys, um, which I'm gonna explain real quickly. And, and that is in the display of the data, it looks like we're equating the validity of the online uh, questionnaire with the visitor intercept information, which is slightly more rigorous. And um, it, it just seems to me that, you know, that, that that's a misrepresentation of, of the validity of the data. 
my inclination is more similar to Karen's where an online survey is helpful in you know, identifying issues or concerns or you know, people's perceptions or whatever. But to characterize either of them as a community survey is incorrect. There, there, it's a, the online survey, uh, questionnaire was not a survey at all. And the, the visitor intercept survey was you know, a random selection of a, a cohort of visitors. And from my perspective, if you are saying that it's a community survey, we should have surveyed the community of Boulder. The open space program is a community program and for us to assign the visitor responses to the community is incorrect. It, the, we, have not, we have not either captured or evaluated the breadth of, of the community. All we have done is on the one hand, capture you know, what interested people uh, want to give us. And on the other hand, uh, you know, a more random selection of, of people. But one of the questions I have on the intercept survey is how are the trails selected and why are there eight multi-use trails and only four pedestrian only trails? It's, it strikes me that, you know, the whole design of of either of those surveys and what we assert are the uh, is the information that are, is, is usable it is highly questionable. So it, in my experience, people have used online survey input to create a list of, uh, to use your words, Colin, um, of the opinions, the ideas, the issues that are presented, the whole range and diversity of those items. Has that kind of a list been made from the inputs from the online survey? I'm not sure I understand your question, honestly. If well, what, what we again. have from the online survey is a, a whole bunch of percentages from responses, which may or may not reflect any identifiable subcategory from the population. But what we do have is, and I spent a couple hours one night reading through pages of comments with ideas from the online survey. Has anybody listed <clears throat> all of the ideas and to show the range of those ideas that were presented by people online and uh, quantify the, the prevalence of those ideas being mentioned, I guess. Yeah, so we did a text analysis. One of the, um, one of the uh, options that the Be Heard Boulder um, platform allows is, is to search different words. And so we did a very robust text analysis uh, and uh, counted up the number of times a particular word was said, looked at different words. Um, that's where we came up with the key themes of safety, um, visitor conflict, uh, speed of e-bikes, and uh, support for e-bike, for regulating e-biker speed. Um, as the primary topics. Um, and were there more than those three or four topics? Uh, in terms of the percentage, like uh, a statistic. Not, not, not statistics and not percentages, just ideas. So as I said, we had a number, uh, we, we probably, uh, first of all, we read through them like you did as well. And as words, came as it appeared that words were said again and again, we did the text analysis. Uh, and um, and out of the, you know, we, we looked at it as there's 2,300 responses. This word appeared this many times. 
So it's a percentage of how many respondents indicated a particular word. Uh, the majority was less than uh, 10%. I don't have the this, this statistics in front of me, but I can certainly bring that information back to you next month if that is something that would be valuable for you. We need some like artificial intelligence built into that and, and have it dictate to us some ideas. Um, I, I, I did try to do a um, word cloud, yeah. but it's very hard um, with 2,300 and you know, over 1,500 um, comments. Uh, and they were even limited in the, in the length of the comments. The words that kept coming up were e-bike and trail. So it wasn't the type of information that would have been valuable to present in a graphic like that, which is why we went through and just looked at the words. Um, so it, it's um, the, the, the themes that we presented are the key themes that, that, uh, that staff felt were, um, were significant enough to bring us themes. The, the reason why I'm questioning three or four themes is my reading through literally hundreds of pages yeah. um, is that there were a lot more than three themes. Uh, and, and it seems to me what the most valuable output from an online survey like that is a plethora of ideas that are presented not the percentages of any one group or another, but, but the list, <clears throat> pardon me, the list of ideas and being a non-tech kind of person. I know how I go about that with a piece of paper and a pencil. <laughs> I have no idea how one would program the analysis to, to get a meaningful product. Um, but it seems to me that kind of a list from all of the online survey responses would be useful. Sure. So, um, for uh, one of the things that staff can take a look at is to provide a um, more robust list of um, ideas that we heard or uh, statements. I think what we what we did is we rolled it up into um, those that expressed some concerns uh, for for e-biking on the system, as well as those that expressed um, that e-bikes are not any more of a safety concern than traditional bikes. But I'd be happy to take a, a look at that and bring that back to you for next month. I think that'd be helpful. And uh, to me, it's not words, it's ideas, uh -huh. which may be phrases, which may be you know, sentences or parts of sentences. Or... And, and that's part of the compendium also of, of... Well, that's what I was reading is the compendium. Right. Anybody else? For this particular... For, for the question of the surveys and the data that we have from the surveys. I'm just going to come back to it. <laughs> It should not be delineated or articulated as a community survey because it was it was not a community survey. It was a survey of it was a sample of visitors, right? Yeah, a survey of users or self-selected participants. And the other concern I have is the inherent bias that was introduced, and I don't know why that is in the study design because the question was. Are is e bike use on open space appropriate? That's the question. What the survey, what the questionnaire and the surveys actually did was presuppose that and introduce the bias that staff has already made the decision, it apparently, that e bike use is appropriate. And so naturally, your responses are going to be, oh, okay, staff has decided that e-bike use is appropriate. So I guess, you know, what I'm going to do is, is answer, you know, respond to, you know, what alternative do I think is, is, is most appropriate? And the fact of the matter is, is that we were trying to get a sense of, right, 
I'm assuming that we were trying to get a sense of the community of how they perceived e-bike use on open space. And a staff alt alternative as part of that initial question skews the data completely because it gives the impression to the respondents that the decision has already been made that it's appropriate. And I, I just fundamentally disagree with that. Having said all that, um, I think, it, you know, I don't think we can go back and kind of re redo everything, but um, it, it's just a big concern that I, I don't think we ought to attribute a whole lot of validity to the data that we got. Yeah, we might have to, we, we have to look at, you know, okay, whether e-bike use on open space is appropriate. So let's do that, but let's not point to the majority of the community or, you know, uh, any of that stuff. It's basically, you know, here's something that we, we've got to figure out. So let's go ahead and do that. I just unfortunately think that a lot of the information that is presented is, is of, I don't want to be too negative, but it's of not very uh, significant or substantive use. Dave, it, can bothers, you, it bothers me. Dave, can you help me understand um, when you say the uh, that it's not a really a community survey, what you mean by that? Do you mean that a community would only be defined by a city of Boulder residents? Yes, or do yes, you yes, Michelle, it's a that it, the open space and mountain parks program is a community of Boulder program. And but it's funded by more than pe people that just who happen to um, be able to afford in the city of Boulder. In fact, it's funded by fund, visitors. Funding, funding is irrelevant. It was a program that was set up by the community of Boulder. And the community of Boulder can decide in its infinite wisdom what it wants to do with you know, open space and mountain parks. And what I'm saying is uh, I'm not particularly interested in what visitors have to contribute to that conversation initially. And I'm even less, not even less, I, I'm a little bit uh, not even interested in what county residents have to say, because this is a city program and we can decide how this program works. And if you want to visit the system, these are the rules and regulations that uh, are in place. And, and so all I'm saying, Michelle, is right out of the chute, we prejudice the response because we said we've already, it looks or we've implied that we've already decided that e-bike use is appropriate. And that is the fundamental question. Is it appropriate? And I, you know, I just can't, I can't understand, you know, kind of how we're attributing all this uh, validity, the information that I think we've introduced a major bias right, right at the outset. I, let me suggest an example of what I consider a community survey and see if Michelle and Dave, you agree with me. Um, for the master plan project in 2019, we commissioned a scientific survey of the community. That is where we got the 2019 master plan survey results. And it was a survey of a statistical, a statistically valid sample of the community. Of residents only. Yes. So you had to have a, a, an address in the city of Boulder. Right. Yes. Isn't that true, Colin? The sample areas primarily included the city. There were two, there were two sample areas. Off the top of my head. I, I can interject the master plan survey included areas one, two, and three, both in and out of city limits. In and out of, okay. My concern how, about how saying- afield, How far afield out of city limits? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> well, nonetheless, it's a misnomer to assign a community component to these surveys because it was not the community. If you want to say it's a community of visitors, then yeah, that might be the community, but basically it was either visitors or people who self-selected to answer the questionnaire. Online. Online, and we don't know, I mean, we do know, I guess, basically some of them were residents and some of them were. And in my mind, it's not only the residency that defines the group for a community survey, but it's also responses like the ones in the 2019 master plan survey, which show us that hiking and walking is a predominant activity for 85% of those people. If that's our community, then I turn to the online engagement survey and I say, wow, the numbers that are shown for the online survey for the, um, where is it? Uh, there aren't page numbers on here, but, but for the primary activity, it shows 35% were bikers and 45% were hikers. And that's nowhere near the proportion of hikers or bikers that are in our community, according to the 2019 scientifically sampled members of our community. And that's an example of what I'm concerned about. Okay. Well, I don't. I don't want to like get too. I just want us to be careful when we we define our community as um, a subset, because I personally consider um, community and belonging not just the city, the, those um, folks who can uh, afford to live in the boundaries of the city of Boulder, and um, which happen to be uh, to skew white and wealthy. And so I just want us to be very careful when we say that people who can't afford to live in our community don't count. Well, uh, I'm, we're, we're not saying that, Michelle, that may be your interpretation, but that, that's not what we're saying. When the open space program was set up, it was set up by a vote of citizens of the city of Boulder. And it was originally put in the city parks department, and it was deliberately and intentionally taken out of the city department. Parks Department in the 1970s to be an independent department because the mission of the open space program was different than a recreation focused department. And so this, the city of Boulder residents made that determination and that decision. And in that decision, they also said, here's how we want to fund this program. And yeah, it was sales tax and whoever comes to Boulder, you know, pays the sales tax. But the, the fact is, is that, you know, that those were all decisions made by the citizens of Boulder. And I, all I'm trying to say is that I just think that if we assign all this importance to these surveys, it, it, it's not helpful. It's not instructive. We, if we're going to look at uh, E-Bike Use on Open Space, okay, let's look at E-Bike Use on Open Space and, and not pretend that there's just this groundswell of support in the community for E-Bike Use on Open Space. And, you know, the other thing is uh, I was principally responsible for writing the definition of passive recreation in the Visitor Master Plan. The council approved that and until the council determines that that's not the definition of passive recreation, that is the definition. And basically when we said non-motorized, we meant human powered recreation. And the exceptions were where human powered recreation needed to have some non-mechanical assistance. Actually, it, it probably that's the, uh, not correct some additional non-human powered assistance. Horseback riding, for example, biking, for example. But uh, the, the, it, it, it's a misnomer to say that we were all focused on gas engine uh, 
you know, motors when in fact that's not true. Uh, we were focused on motors and human uh, powered recreation. As the two separate things. Right. An example of this, if you turn to the page in the PowerPoint slides that we have in our packet, it says support for alternatives or status quo. Um, again, no page number, but um, there's on the left side, it's Karen, just, um, in, in the bottom, it's kind of in small print, but there is a page number in the bottom in the dark. <sighs> Just to yeah, I'm list. just saying that they, they are there. <laughs> they were added. Um, Is that 29? Maybe 29? No, maybe, maybe 26. Okay. Thank you. Page 26. Uh, yeah. Um, I think the I think as Dave has been saying, the numbers on the in the bar graphs on the left hand side for online engagement are irrelevant to our discussion because they're not a statistically valid sample of either visitors or the community. So in my mind, I have crossed out the two left bars on the bar graph. And putting them there gives the appearance that the validity is the same and it is not. Well, and it also gives the uh, opinion that Alternative B is selected by some group. Well, it was selected by the group of people who went online and filled out the survey. And that to me is not the basis for any decision that the Open Space Board it was actually should be selected made. by staff. No, no, the online engagement was people who went online and filled out that survey. I know, but they looked at these alternatives and the alternatives. The alternatives were selected by staff, right. Right. But the percentages were selected by the people who went online. And the fact that 43% of the people who went online marked alternative B is not anything that I'm going to use to make a decision as an open space board of trustees member. Because my responsibility on the open space board of trustees is to reflect community perspectives in decision making. Whose community? I guess we're we're kind of um, discounting the, the statistically the, the statistically valid sample that describes Boulder's community as represented in, for instance, the 2019 master plan survey. It's not my decision. It's not your decision. It's it's a definition of our community based on a statistically valid sample. Okay, we haven't gotten to the online intercept, or I'm sorry, the intercept survey, which is, and I know you, you dispute this, Dave, um, is at least in the memo called statistic, statistically relevant, uh, st statistically valid uh, sampling. Um, no, it's a sampling of visitors. Right, it, it was a random sample. A random whether, sample. Yeah, whether it's statistically valid, I think is questionable. Because and I guess I, 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 and, I, and the trail selection, Michelle. You know, when you again, Colin, you got to tell me if if you're picking eight trails of multi-use trails to sample and four trails of pedestrian only use, how were those trails selected? How were they comparable? And why why are there eight multi-use and only four? pedestrian use, because then you come in the analysis and say, well, there are all these people that said that, you know, they agreed with e-bikes, but that data, those data are prejudiced because you had, a, you had a larger sample size for that particular cohort, unless you tell me differently. <laughs> I'll, uh, Colin, it's your, <laughs> you're up. We can't see each other because we're all sitting in a straddle here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we actually we have to look up at the screen. We actually went through a couple iterations of trying to decide how to sample. So one one consideration was this was an overlay operationally on top of already running the visitor survey at the same time. So. We did actually consider implementing these questions as a subcomponent of the visitor survey. 
that uh, presented a challenge where we didn't think we'd probably be able to get much of a sample size by the in the time frame that we were given. So our next option was to look at known uh, visitation levels across different areas. Um, I think we shared a, a map. One of the things we wanted to try and do was get some spatial distribution across the system in each of the TSAs. So, and then the reason that there were uh, eight multi-use trails in there is that if e-bikes is to be considered, we felt that those that those represented the users that were likely to begin encountering that type of activity. And so, but don't you think that skews your data analysis? Because you sampled a far larger cohort to get that information than than other cohorts, and so when you say, "Well, it's only thirty, or the uh, status quo was only thirty-seven percent," you know that only, that represents only, you know, theoretically a half of what you sampled. It said, you know, sixty-three percent, and that's my concern. Is that I don't think it was fairly distributed as far as the sampling was concerned. So there are always there are always trade offs. One of the things that I don't know if I've had a chance to to look at the online report. Um, it doesn't show all of the possible cross comparisons in there, but if you do go to the alternatives page, one of the things you can do is filter by activity group. And when you do that and you filter by different activity groups, you will see some changes in the level of support. Um, hiking, which did represent the largest activity group in there, shows pretty similar distributions to the um, levels of support overall across the three individual alternatives, as well as the preferred option. To which bar graph? Uh, this is on the um, alternatives overview page. It'll, it displays the three individual alternatives. Do we have a graph I, of this? Yeah, can I? Yeah. I'd suggest, Colin, maybe it might be useful to walk um, the trustees through a little bit of what is available um, for exploring the um, results, because it, it's a pretty cool tech tool, and I'm not yeah, sure if and I spent an hour or so with it, but, oh, okay. as, but, you know, that kind of exploration on my own doesn't get me information that I would use for decision making. What I need is the professional expertise that set that up to do the, to talk me through the analysis. And as Dave's saying, to talk me through the sampling. So doing it on my own is, is just about as valid, as useful to me as spending a couple hours on my own reading through the comments. Because I need the professional analysis. Is that it's about a 50-50 split in the community actually. Um, and yeah, these data don't necessarily reflect that, but I, I think that uh, it's the, the, the split is a lot closer than you're attributing from these data. And I don't see anywhere data that would lead me to the conclusion that was on the screen before and that alternative B is the preferred alternative according to the respondents. That doesn't show up anywhere except for the online engagement survey, and that's not a valid source for decision making. So I don't understand where alternative B is the preferred alternative comes from. Because I look at this, and for the intercept survey, alternative A is preferred. If I get just jump back to some of your questions about different uh, different subgroups of the survey. One of the ways that we've looked at at handling that, and we did have to make some decisions about what you'd be able to cross filter by. It sounds like there's maybe a couple of uh, additional cross filters which we could add in there that I can say we have looked at. So we did ask about residency. Um, which means that we can take that subset of responses for by different residency, residency groups looking at how that breaks out. We can do the same thing pretty much for any of our uh, 
demographic or activity based questions. So, what is your primary activity? Um, what's your, you know, what age group do you belong to? What's your residency group? And so far in those, we have continued to see similar distributions. You will see that the sort of similar, to what? Uh, similar distributions in terms of uh, support but and similar to the to on-site survey no similar, similar to, to the overall so um, to a combination of the online and intercept uh, to a combination of all the intercept survey responses all the intercept survey responses correct not the online correct okay Thank you. I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just had to know which survey you referred to. And those were included statically in your in your material, as were the online. Correct. Why um, can't the online um, survey results be filtered like the intercept ones? I, I mean, I thought it was really cool to be like, oh, I want to only see what the results, what the hikers thought of this, this and that. So it's just because of the technology that was used? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can start by answering that. And that is that um, the uh, Be Heard Boulder engagement webpage that is used across the whole city organization um, was what we used as our uh, methodology um, and our platform for the engagement questionnaire. Um, there are several uh, questionnaires on there now, gathering uh, public input as well. Um, it, it, so it, the intent of that is like a one-time thing during decision-making process to be able to do that. Um, the, the time and effort that it takes to take that information um, and compute it into that digital report is something I could have our, our human dimensions team speak to. Um, but it, it's a part of it is that it's a one time thing that isn't, we talked about it being generalizable or um, what's the other word? <laughs> random, uh, random. Um, and, and, uh, and being able to use it for trend analysis. I think that the cost benefit of doing the work that our, uh, that Colin and his team have done on the data is most valuable when it can be used. Um, in comparison to other other data. Did I get any of that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean the other the other component to that is that the not to not to get into the technical side of here of it, but a lot of the data pipelines and the processes that we have been working on that allow us to do that report are components of many of the other uh, Surveys that visitor surveys, visitor that, surveys that we have been working on. So and there's, I want a, there's to be a lot of just because you're talking sure. about just visitor surveys, right? Correct. So so a lot of that infrastructure has been supported, and just the development of that didn't all come about because of the bike surveys. Do, do you ever and and I might be using the wrong technical term, but do you ever normalize visitor survey data to the population? That was defined for the 2019 master plan survey? We do not. What we what we focus on with the visitor survey is uh, collecting a representative sample of who we think visits open space. Those demographics can then be compared to other demographic sources to see where the differences are. But based on our sampling methods, we do, uh, it, it is our determination that the demographics that we get from the visitor survey are representative of, of, visitors. of visitors, which is where we sort of leave that context. And, and have you ever done that comparison of master plan survey population versus visitor survey population? In terms of? So that somebody can look at them and see the difference between those two populations. There are a lot of possible places that those, those differences, a lot of 
comparisons that would have to be made. But what we can do and have done in the past is look at differences in response. And I remember all the cross tabulation tables that are in the, in the last report, but where we do take certain measures and break out the differences in response rates by different residency categories. So that if you did within one the if, within the visitor period. survey, so that if you want to look at responses across different categories, you could. Okay, but so there's no there's no analysis to show the difference between the master plan survey population and a visitor survey population. No, no formal analysis, no. So sometimes my understanding is that they're not directly comparable because like a resident survey format could weight results by census demographics to make um, our understanding representative. So I think it's interesting. There's a really rich conversation here around kind of how we define the community that we serve as you know, a public open space, which I, for one, would love to dive into another time. Um, I, I also think it's just worth kind of reiterating that through these different survey mechanisms, we can really look at what just the residents of Boulder preferences are. And through both survey options, we are seeing majority support for allowing e-bikes in some form. And how um, can we see that? Say a little bit more about how we can see that. So, um, and I don't know, Colin, if you're willing to kind of talk through the interactive report, but we can, so we do ask residency as part of these surveys, so we can look at that. Yeah, I think that the other thing to maybe kind of highlight on a broad level is that we have kind of as staff have determined that visitor surveys are a really good tool to understand our broader residents who visit open space, um, even better than some of our resident surveys because of the sample size. So I just kind of wanted to bring back that kind of, like these are the tools that we consider the best available to understand public opinion on different topics. And, you know, there's one, there's the question of how do we get the most representative data, which we care about a lot. And then there's the question of, we wanna hear from everybody, right? We'd never wanna limit who can provide feedback on a topic important to them. So that's why the open participation becomes yeah. you know, more important. But there's a lot of different ways we can look at this data. And I think it's just true sometimes that when individuals have really strong sentiments, it's hard to take data and when it doesn't match your opinions trust it so i just maybe challenge everybody to like you know keep asking the questions keep diving into it but but challenge yourself to also kind of trust a broader sample size we used to do resident surveys and visitor surveys as two different things do we still do resident surveys we have decided to largely stop doing resident surveys because um, yeah and because that when we get down to the response rates and really look at it we we have a lot more confidence in our visitor surveys that we're getting a better understanding of our residents. visitors mm -hmm. the, the piece that we can miss from that is a small subset and i can you know hd can fill in these the numbers details much better than me but the small subset of our residents who don't visit open space, we we would want you know more of an open participation forum to capture that. And that's the problem, Francis, is that the visitor surveys do not capture the breadth or extent of the community. There, there are a certain number of community members that are very supportive of the open space program, who never who never go on open space, but they like the idea. They support the importance of it, and you know they, they support have, the taxes and the votes, right? And they have some interest in making sure that you know it's sustained and managed appropriately, and that sort of thing. And visitor surveys only focus on a, a subset, and I'm going to still use the word community, and we are we do not pick up. 
the number of people of which I think they're in this town is probably fairly sizable that just support the idea of open space. And whether they go on it ever or not is irrelevant. They support it. And so the question is, do they think that e-bike use is appropriate on open space? And, and all I'm saying is that I think that when you, and I, I, I got to ask the question, why did you start with the preferred alternative as part of the, the questionnaire in the intercept survey? Because I think that skews the, the response again, right out of the chute. It's like the determination has already been made when in fact, we want to hear from the community on what they think. I'd like to clarify that the online engagement um, had a, a slightly different objective than the on-site intercept. So the on, online engagement did present a, a preliminary preferred alternative based on the analysis that the uh, core team did. However, the, um, the, the on-site intercept done by our HD team did not identify um, a preferred well, alternative. Why, are, why is there a bar graph then that in the data that says that that did come out of the intercept? It, it presented three um, management alternatives, uh, but it did not state that um, there was one of these that's a that is being considered as a preferred alternative. They were um, survey uh, on-site inter on-site intercept um, respondents were shown um, a map of each of the three management alternatives and said, um, "To what degree do you um, would you support alternative A?" And we presented that in your materials uh, there. So, Marty, I got to ask you, if you took the survey in, and you were out on open space and came in and tried and someone said, do you want to take the survey? And they and in the survey, there were three alternatives of, you know, potential use. Wouldn't you think, well, gee, you know, the decision has already been made that this use is, is happening or appropriate for open space. They wouldn't be asking me my opinion on alternatives if they have already decided that it's, it's something that, you know, is, is okay. But you have in your inbox as of, what was it, 4 o'clock this afternoon or something, I looked at it at 4.30 or 5 o'clock. Um, you have a copy of the survey questions that were used at the intercept survey. Yes. And it does not, as Marty says, it does not say staff is recommending alternative I, B. I understand. And your point is made by the comparison of these two graphs. Because right. when, when they do not say our choice is alternative B, guess which choice wins? A. Alternative A. a. Yeah. A. So uh, your point is made by the data. When they, when they bias the whole survey and say, we've chosen alternative B, which one do you like? Right. Guess which one wins? Right. And point, when they don't say staff has chosen alternative B, then alternative B does not get chosen. Yeah, so that's why I'm challenging the question that was up on this, the statement that was up on the screen is the majority of people chose alternative B. It, that's wrong. Staff chose alternative B and the majority of people, when they were not biased, chose alternative A. I agree completely with that. But I also say, realistically, if you're presented with a bunch of alternatives of, of use, wouldn't you think that, gee, you know, this use has already been determined to be appropriate. So they're asking me kind of, you know, where and how much and that right. sort of thing. Right. It's not the question of whether that use is appropriate or, or, or should be allowed. It's the, the implication is, is that it's going to be allowed, it's appropriate. Where should it go? And they did not, as you're saying, they did not have an alternative D that said uh, yeah. e-bikes will not be allowed. Right. I think, did that come? That, that doesn't in, come on the intercept survey at all. So, so, I thought it came in later. As a choice, it came in later. Change. 
Yeah, but if you look at the first page of this. So the way that the three individual alternatives were presented was on a scale of strongly opposed to right. strongly support with a neutral option in the middle. Yeah. And then after the, after the board meeting, then we implemented a follow-up question after the rating reasons page that simply stated overall, which option do you most prefer? And that included A, B, C, and no change. So you're saying a no change was one of the board you go to your last page on that. It ended. It, that's that's the one where we we simplified down and said this isn't about support or opposition between three alternatives or no change. Which you must. I'm sorry, prefer. it's not on the last page. Did, did that come in later in the survey? It, no, it came in in week four of the survey. We ran the survey for nine weeks and we implemented it during the. Second of sort of our three. So four. did you discard the first four weeks? What we did is we looked at the distribution of support of the ratings. And part of the reason that we implemented that preferred option after was so that once we did implement it, respondents would be presented with the same three, four, four sets of pages so that we could look to see if there was a sudden change in the distribution of responses on that because we didn't want to prime people with the overall preferred option effect. So I, I just think you preordain the outcome. So as, as I said, I don't know that we should continue to labor the data or the surveys other than to say that the information is modestly interesting um it, it can we can use it to a certain extent but i think you know the question is okay what are we going to do on the ground i mean that's what we that's what we got to get you know what what makes the most sense on the ground and i would just uh hope that we can you know get there because i i don't think there's any point in continuing to discuss you know the implications of the data. Um, we we got to figure out. Okay, you know what makes sense on the top. And Dave, if I can jump in again because I was able to just look it up, and it might just help the broader understanding. Since we're doing a deeper dive into kind of survey methodology in this discussion, um, in our last resident survey, is one to two percent of respondents did not visit open space, which is part of why we consider visitor surveys such a good way to kind of understand both our, our visitors and, and residents. Well, Francis, we're finding out today that one or 2% actually is a, is a big deal in certain instances. So uh, I wouldn't be too dismissive of that. <laughs> I don't mean to dismiss, I just mean in terms of like the options we have and why we use them, but of course we, always look at the ends and we I did not mean to dismiss those people. <laughs> yeah, I just think the, uh, the distinction, the differences or whatever you want to call it is closer than the information that we're looking at suggests. And, and I'm not saying that the status quo or, or no e-bikes is, is in the majority, but it's certainly, I think, uh, closer. And, and so what that says for us as the board is that we have to be mindful of the community's uh, response and expectation of what we need to do. And so for me, that's not, you know, carte blanche saying, okay, you know, and I know we're not saying that, but e-bikes everywhere or, or whatever, it means that we've got to be very careful and considerate of, you know, what, what we're actually going to end up doing. Um, Colin, I want to ask one specific question about the, the data on 60-year-old-plus people. <laughs> because on the intercept survey, for the 60-plus people, the ones that chose e-biking versus the status quo was relatively equal. And um, I want to know whether that's accurate information. 
Uh, yes. Yeah, when and, we, and when what we the, what the 30 to 59 year olds say about 60 year olds is not particularly relevant to me. I, I want to hear from the 60 year old plus population what they think about e bikes. <coughs> and I'm, I'm wondering if on your fancy analysis tool, whether you can show me anything that will lead me to have greater understanding about what 60 plus year olds think. Yeah, Colin, would you be able to, to portray the filters up here? I, I know, you, I don't know. Can you connect your computer or can Allison connect her computer to that so we can see it and you can talk about it? I can, and, and I think what I'm gonna to need to do is, is give you one example and then, go back in and add in a couple of the other demographics that you want to be able to cross filter by. Um, but I can I can show you how that would how that would work. Okay. Should we give you a couple minutes and, and come back to you or uh, is this something that you have there now? Depends on how quickly I can open it. A small zoom window. And you know, ahead, maybe, maybe the, the goal here was to ask questions for them to come back with data in December or, you know, would it make more Good sense point. to yep. let, let them collect it and come back and present it? Okay. Good point. Okay. If it's too much okay. trouble. And, and I know we, I, I feel like we must have been 30 minutes at this point, if yeah. not more. So yeah. um, we beat this dead horse. I, say. Uh, I, I would like to add, I, I think the, the data is fantastic. You all have done amazing job presenting it, pulling it together. Uh, I was just playing around on the website, like, you know, looking at it in different slices. Um, for the intercept survey? Yeah, for the intercept survey. It's a, it's a really cool tool, and you've done a great job pulling it together. And I really appreciate it, so thank you. <laughs> Long table. Who is that guy? He's talking to you. <laughs> Let's go on to issues that need to be addressed. And I'm and this is directed to towards list. staff or is this directed toward each other? Well, I'm eager to see the list that Marnie produces from the online, are those called comments? Mm -hmm. Online comments. Um, but as John just pointed out, we won't have that until December. So um, for now, what we have is what we want to be discussing among each other, Michelle, to answer your question. You want to begin? Yeah, I mean, I guess the biggest question is, because um, I, I heard you say, Dave, that, okay, there's surveys. Surveys are not perfect. Questions are not perfect. It's, data, it, it's a data point. Um, I also heard Karen, you say you wanted to listen to the people in the master plan, what they said. I'm not really sure. I understand what you're, you were getting out there. Was there an e-bike question in the master plan? No, the master okay. plan was a statistically valid sample of the community. Okay. But how could we retroactively go back to that population of people and say, what do you think? Um, I just asked I so. Colin that, and Colin said it hasn't been done, and it, and they haven't done it, and they basically can't do it in okay. the next two weeks. Yeah. And so that's I heard. To that, that, yeah. to that question, yeah. as I understand it. Um, and then, so I guess the, the biggest issue is, do we agree that um, using an e-bike is passive recreation? And now, Dave, I heard you say, okay, surveys this, is that, what are we gonna do? There's a problem here. What, what, and I know we're not, we're not talking about what we're gonna do right now because we, we still need to hear from the public um, in December. Um, but the, the question looming, I think, is, is that. That's, I agree, that's a core question. 
<laughs> Is anybody willing to tip their hand? Well, and then also, uh, if you wouldn't mind also answering, and is there any other information you need from that staff could help pull together to help you in having this kind of conversation? Um, and if not, that's great. If it's a pretty simple sort of issue from this point forward for you all to have that conversation, that's great. But also just keep in mind if there's any uh, information support we can provide. Dan, I... I think that we've we've had a conversation that the request I made, I, I'm gonna restate yep. on the maps that yep. we got a lot of yep. yeah, I I think uh, it would be very helpful to have uh, wait a minute. Is this is this in response to Michelle's question about yes. passive? Well this is because I want to stay with that for a minute before we move to something else. This is a response to the Dan's suggestion that we let staff know what else yeah. we need. Okay, we'll go there. Okay. First, let's pursue the, is e-biking passive recreation? I'll come to you next, promise. John, do you have a comment? Uh, generally, uh, yes, I would be supportive. Of defining e-bikes as passive recreation? Yes. Be, do you want to say because? <laughs> uh, be, because, um, you know, uh, what passive recreation was, you know, when uh, open space was first created is different than what it is now with bikes and, and animals and it's 2022 and bikes and technology have changed and we should occasionally revisit our definitions and what we allow, um, you know, to, to meet current technology and standards. Um, I also think you know, overall, you know, taking a step back from just, you know, classifying it as passive recreation you know, allowing, um, you know, e-bikes on commuter trails, encouraging people to drive less, helps the city meet greenhouse gas emission goals, reduces vehicle miles traveled. Um, and for us to, you know, not at least be supportive of that, um, you know, if it feels irresponsible in some way, so. I think there's some common ground there. My response would be, no, I don't think it's passive recreation, but the charter allows for exceptions and we might determine that this warrants an exception. And then we decide where those exceptions are designated. Do, and I'm no lawyer, but how can you say that it's not passive recreation and say, but it is here and there and this other place? based on because it's motorized it doesn't meet the definition and that's what again i i don't agree with the staff analysis that it meets the definition um but we the charter also says that we can make exceptions we make ex exceptions for people in wheelchairs we make exceptions for people pushing strollers we, we make exceptions uh, on a variety of of different uses in areas, and we can certainly do that if it's appropriate in this case. And uh, Michelle, maybe what you're getting at is that we have to classify it as passive recreation to be able to put those restrictions in place on it, because otherwise we can't say it's allowed at all, right? Like, unless we say it's passive recreation, we can't say, oh, it's allowed in these places, right? That's my understanding, and co correct me if I'm wrong, that first of all we have to come to terms that this is passive recreation and then we can decide where can we allow it but maybe i'm totally misunderstanding how the procedure here marnie i saw you nodding your head you're before. you're you're correct so um the charter does limit open space use to passive recreation and then it identifies um, activities such as the you know the ones that that are listed um, as passive recreation, um, and that's charter language. That's charter so language. So that would if we were to change charter language, we'd need to go to a vote of the people, right? right. Oh. But but, but the, we don't but need the, to change charter language in this instance. Right. Yeah, right. I just wanted to make that yeah. point. Yeah. So uh, so I, I think it's a astute point, Michelle. That um, the question is is e biking pa passive recreation and. Um, I think there is a 
I think that we can provide some uh, examples. I mean, the one I'm thinking of is just what, what Boulder County just grappled with in determining um, how to allow e-bikes on open space uh, county trails. Um, and that was the decision that they came to. It did require um, a, the county commissioner supported e-biking on open space trails, and it required the planning commission to review and refine the definition of passive recreation. And they chose to narrowly define it by adding in e-biking. Um, I don't have that information. It's certainly information we can provide for next month if it would be helpful in, in the discussion that you would subsequently have to determine whether or not the city of Boulder um, and the board would, uh, would you know, might, might find something similar to what the county um, landed on. Did you want to walk through the how we were thinking doing that or not right now? Or like, is that a Boulder County example? Just thinking. Well, I mean, we, we laid out the, the approach that it, if it was determined uh, when we go to council, uh, of what if council said, well, if we want to do it, how would we do it? What would be our approach? And we laid that out in the memo itself. We could uh, clarify that more, provide more information on that approach of having a legislative finding by council that e-biking would be considered passive. And then the question would be, then where? And uh, uh, one approach would be uh, a city manager rule of how that would get designated and applied on the ground. So yeah, two-step processes. Council would need to find that e-biking is now included as a passive recreation. And then where it's applied uh, could be through um, a uh, city manager rule of where it gets designated. I, my, where my hang up is, Michelle, is that, that the visitor master plan says passive recreation, as Marnie showed on the screen, is defined as non motorized activities. And I don't care if the motor is propelled by water or wind or electricity or coal or fossil fuels. If it's a motorized activity, it's not passive according to the visitor master plan definition, which was approved by council. So that's a council determined definition of passive recreation. And, and for me, the choke point is passive recreation is defined as non-motorized activities. Right, so that does mean we need to go in front of council and, and have that visited. And there's also BRC code language right now, which prohibitively uh, prohibits e-bikes on open space. City open space. And that ordinance would need to be changed as well. So yes, we definitely need to make a stop at council if we want to make a change in, and they would need to make the determination uh, of passive and then make some code changes, ordinance changes. I mean, the reason why I bring this up is because we have this three month process ahead of us. Well, two more, two additional months. But if, if Karen, you don't, you don't get beyond the, and I understand your interpretation um, that it, that it's not passive recreation. Then there's like no debate to really be had with you right now over the different alternatives. I'm being extreme, but I'm just saying like, but if you fundamentally believe that, then then I, I don't know that we, we're, we're gonna have like a really good process here. Well, we could still have the process. And I guess that's what I'm trying to say is that, uh, first of all, I'm, I might change my mind. And second of all, um, if I get outvoted, then for me, it's important to look at, okay, where is it gonna happen? If, if it's going to happen. So I, I still think there's a role, you know, for however we come down individually on this 
for the conversation to continue to the, its conclusion. And if the council decides that it needs to revisit the definition of passive recreation, the least the board should do is say, well, if that's the case, here's where we think it's appropriate on the system. So, you, Dave, I think you're suggesting that we might, the, the board might recommend to council, we don't think EVAC should be passive recreation, but if you think that, right. then here's our recommendation on the right. plan. Is that right? Just okay. right. Or, or another way of framing that to editorialize on what you yeah. just said might be, we don't think it's passive recreation because of the following things. Right. And that's why the list that Marty is gonna prepare is so important, is we need to include all the perceptions that have been offered about the pluses and minuses of e-bikes. And I, based on the couple hours I spent looking at those comments, nobody said, OPDMD was an appropriate use of e-bikes. Well, I'm and sorry, can you one. just say that again? <laughs> <laughs> what? I, don't, I, don't I, 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 I didn't I understand where in the comments anybody said OPDMD is, is an appropriate space. use of e-bikes in outer space. Fire hands. Okay. Because I don't think anybody uses that term except in the master plan. Other personal mobility device, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. And th I think that um, just to the uh, OPDMD uh, acronym on that um, is the department's um, acronym. You're right, that, but it is the application. It's my understanding, it's the application of the American Disabilities Act. It's defined in the, the master plan government. on page, where is it? While you're looking, Karen, I can jump into the um, other power-driven mobility devices. Are it's on page. It's on page one thirty-two of the master plan, and it says um, the, the implicate is it's under the strategy that has to do with update, updating <laughs> guidelines and standards for quality trail design and construction. But it, it, in fact, has to do with usage. And, um, and it makes it clear that it's, according to the Justice Depart US Justice Department in 2014, it's our responsibility to provide for those needs for people with disabilities and OPD, MDs. So it could be that the definition you know, in addition to being responsive to the many constraints and concerns that people listed in the in the online comments, that we need to also include OPDMD when we're defining passive recreation and appropriate use on open space. <clears throat> in addition to all the conflicts and the width of the trail and the speed and the enforcement and and things like ignition from the uh, battery powered mechanisms. Um, but all of those things are, are concerns and constraints that at least some people think need to be addressed before we allow e-bikes on open space. And I can build on that a little bit that the OPDMD classification is is really very broad, and it basically the the meaning of it is that any device that somebody with a mobility disability wants to use on open space trails, even if it's not specifically designed um, for right. somebody with a mobility disability, like and in the federal legislation that we follow. Um, so can use a broad range of devices on our trails until or unless we conduct an assessment and restrict the type of device and the places where that can go, which we are actually in the process of evaluating that policy and, and we're planning on kind of sharing kind of more focus on 
the accessible element of this topic after we complete um, the e-bike policy part because they're interrelated. But you can't, very you can't share that with us in December. No, it's, you know, they're, they're very interrelated, but they're pretty separate. So, you know, we, the current state is that people can use OPDMDs if you have a mobility disability on our system. So Francis, if, if um, somebody with a, a disability wanted to take a gas powered ATV on Springbrook Loop, could they? Yes currently, which is why we're undertaking an assessment to kind of, under the legislation, we can restrict the type of devices based on natural or cultural resource impacts. Um, so that's why, you know, staff are pursuing refining that policy, but I, it, it gets pretty confusing, honestly. So I think it's helpful to separate, even though it is so intercorrect, connected, it's helpful to separate that a little bit from the e-bike specific policy. Well, now that we said that on the public record, I'm seeing, I think we're gonna have snowmobiles out there in Chautauqua. <laughs> because it's yeah. legally actually allowed. Don't give anyone any- You would help. have to have a mobility disability for that. Absolutely, really yes, yes. <laughs> but I now we- I talked to some older people this week who bought e-bikes and tried them and found out that they required more muscle and that they weren't able to handle them. And so then sold the new e-bikes that they had bought. Um, how does one make sure that the people who are operating these things can handle them? Who is that question directed toward? I don't know. <laughs> Anybody who has an answer. I mean, I, I have a little bit of familiarity with the AID American Disabilities Act, which is a federal um, guidance. And um, it, it has been a topic uh, for all government agencies and access to buildings and lands and everything else. Um, there's very specific guidelines relative to um, imposing what, you know, imposing a, um, a, the ask of what is your disability? Um, the, it gets, as, as Francis mentioned, it gets pretty complex pretty quickly. Um, and I don't know if one of the things we, but I, I think one of the things we could do between now and December um, is to give a little bit more context relative to I'm talking with our risk management team uh, overall who's been involved in this over the years um, in terms of um, the criteria relative to ADA accessibility and um, equity and access, um, which is a topic well beyond open space. And like I said, it has to do with access to buildings and everything else. Yeah. So, um, I, I personally don't feel comfortable um, discussing what it what one individual's experience of being able to operate an e-bike means relative to somebody else's ability who may be experiencing disability and choose that as their mobility device. Um, that's what the federal government says is permitted. And there are very specific um, guardrails around what perhaps like our rangers would be able to engage a community member relative to their choice of mobility device and using that on our land. It's very specific and um, you have to be um, clear about that. And I think that's part of what our rangers would understand and know. I would also add, you know, we are talking about a broad range of devices and one of our staff, uh, Topher, does offer tours um, using adaptive hand cycles on our system. So uh, it, to your question, Karen, of how does one know if a certain type of device is suitable for what you're looking for, that's one opportunity that that could be. Um, well, and bike shops allow people to try them out as well. So 
before you buy it, you can do that too. <laughs> True story, yeah. <laughs> um, there's been several comments about enforcement and speeds. I wanna hear from a staff member um, how the rangers are envisioning enforcing speeds. And I ask that not um, in a nasty way, but in a realistic way of, you know, we know the limits on the number of rangers on the system at any one time and the number of miles of trails and, and the ability for rangers to be someplace to enforce anything is minimal. So I don't think this enforcing speed is a job for rangers just because they can't be there um, in the numbers that would require to enforce speed. So I'd like to see how, how enforcement in dealing with speed would be handled and could be handled on a system as large as ours. And maybe if, uh, piggybacking on that, Dan, uh, if, if we have any information on, you know, kind of enforcement to date, that, that would be, I think, informative. To on date about e-bikes. About e-bikes. Right. E-bikes. Uh, and, and how about speed with bikes yeah. in general? For, and the, the, the Boulder County um, uh, Parks and Open Space conducted their speed observations. Um, and and I, I found, found that very interesting that um, e-bikers went faster uphill, but they actually went slower downhill. Yep. You saw that data tonight, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's in the packet. It's 14.8 yep. miles. Yeah, I just found that I found that interesting, but and I I haven't ridden a, uh, an e bike on on um, on um, on open space or trails before, but just on the um, you know on the paths. But that rings true because they are heavier, and so you want to have. Um, I I know I'm more cautious going downhill than I am uphill. The other thing that seems to me is a really important variable that I don't think we have enough information about is trail width and density of visitors on trails. And I know I got a response from Marnie late this afternoon that said that these neighboring agencies by and large don't have that kind of data. Um, but my perception anecdotally is that um, that the trail density on city open space trails is higher than the trail density on county open space trails, which leads me to believe yes. visitor density, thank you, um, which leads me to believe that we can't directly move from the county to the city with the same premise. Because, because of the density of visitors on our trails. Yeah, and in the timeline that we had to provide you the materials. I understand. Yeah, so there were lots I mean, of limitations. Yeah, yeah and um, uh, we reached out to the entities that, yeah. you know, we, we um, interface with or, it, in, or that we're not connected with. I, I do think that Boulder County Parks and Open Space has a pretty robust data um, a data set for visitation um, by activity type, um, and um, their person manages that happens to be out of the office. So we got what we were able to provide. Yeah, yeah. So it's another one of those things that we can um, do a little bit more work on between now and this. Could you provide us with some side by side comparisons for city trails and county trails so that we can see? We can certainly take a look at that and see. And obviously, it varies from one trail to the next. So that there would have to be a lot of columns. Of well, I mean, we we can see what we can what we can accomplish between now and then, as well as what would be available to do that. Okay. Um, and I promise to go back to you to talk about trail maps. All right, Dan. Dan, I think has it. But basically, when I 
have requested is that we get a map or maps that show rather than kind of the segmented spaghetti maps that we yeah. have here yeah. that show the connections to existing, you know, either greenway or bike paths or kind of distinctly what we're trying to connect. Um, both regionally and, and kind of in the city um, so that when we look at them, we have some sense of uh, the relationship between the segments that, you know, that we were addressing and the rest of the system. So I a trail, a trail, intro, yeah. you know, a trail map with connection points marked. Okay. And, and trails and, identified. And how, and how about trail width? I'd like to see on that. Map trail widths. Uh, that, that could be, I guess. I, <laughs> I didn't specifically request that, but that could be uh, something that I don't know, Dan, I, I guess could be included. We do okay. have a uh, average trail width available on our website as part of access information as part of our broader accessibility. So you could pull that up, you could pull that out up for the trails under consideration. Mm -hmm. Easily. Yeah, we could probably, you know, look at a table of that. I, I, um, I think that we can provide some more information on our maps. I, I do, um, I do wonder how how easy it's going to be to be able to depict the amount of information you're seeking on a, on a map because of it's a huge system. So, um, we can try to see how creative we can get with providing the materials. What I hear you saying is. You're looking for um, the, the maps that can better depict. I, I think what you're asking for is um, better de depict the transition between our lands and our apartment lands, right, the, the trails, right. the connections, the places, because, where, the because, places where there will, are or will be connections. Right. Um, and the the maps that were provided do show those, but they are right. smaller. I mean, we, we tried to really make the ones that are being considered for um, e-bikes to pop, pop okay. more. And so I think that we can do some creative work for that. I also heard that you have an interest in better understanding the trails that would be proposed for e-biking um, and the, the, the trail widths of those. Yes. So and, and the density of visitor use on those trails. So and how they compare map, to Boulder County. Uh, on this and how map, they compare to Boulder County. Yep. yep. Um, I think Marty, you know, I, I don't know that there's a lot of extraneous information, but there were a fair number of lines. And so for me, you know, if we can get rid of, you know, information that it doesn't really contribute to the understanding of, you know, where, where these connections are and kind of relationship. Uh, between them and the, and the other trails that, that we're proposing to serve, then we probably don't need that. You know, we may need some major streets or, you know, some uh, some information that orients, you know, the viewer to kind of where things are at. But it just struck me that there, there were a lot of lines and they were pretty indistinct, but probably we didn't need if we're just looking at, okay, how are these trails um, related. So, and the other thing is, if we can do a large format map and then fold it, uh, you know, to eight and a half by 11 or to fit it in the packet, I, if we can do that, I think that would be great so that, you know, the map is larger so that that information is clearer. So, and I want to underscore what Dave just said about where these trail segments begin and end. It's just not obvious to me at all where this little squiggly line starts and finishes. One small request with the maps is to not use too many colors that are close to each other or try to right. try to um, distinguish it with like hash marks or something. Thank you. I'm colorblind and it's I have a hard time reading maps because of that. I'm not colorblind and I have a hard time reading. <laughs> but, but we're going to sit down and we're going to go over that. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Dave. Dave is my map tutor. <laughs> so thanks. That, that would be very helpful. Yeah. But uh, another thing that was mentioned a few times was 
earbuds and people going along on a bike with earbuds and therefore not being able to tell when somebody was sh shouting at them or waving them off or something. Is that anything that can be done about that? That would be an enforcement. There is a local ordinance that I think would apply to open space trails um, that prohibits um, by, uh, bikers from having earbuds in both ears. They I oh think, really? Yeah, I think I think they are allowed to have one in one ear, but not in both. But I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I'll have to look it up. Yeah, so I mean, we can we can certainly take a closer look at that as well. Um, Great. I had no idea that there. I it's, it, I bet there are a lot of people that have no idea that there's that kind of rule. And, and I'm not sure if it's just to bikers. It could be to any. It could also apply to pedestrians crossing the road, interacting. With yeah, them. yeah. I think and it if, actually applies to drivers too. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The drivers are not allowed to have earbuds in or headphones in. Um, what could you give us a list of what the um, current fines are and penalties, are, if any? I've had people ask me, well, you know, what, what, what is it? I'm like, I don't know if, if they're taking an e-bike on Boulder Canyon right now. Is, is there a fine? Good idea. Yeah. So we can bring that back to you as well. Um, and then... This business of ignition from like in the latest wildfire north of town from the weed whipper. Um, I understand that there's no such thing as a spark arrestor for an e-bike, but there's something called a BMS. That's the, it's functionally a regulator to prevent ignition. And so I'd like to learn a lot more about BMS uh, regulators that prevent wildfires from e-bikes as they're going through the grasses on the open spark, space lands. Spark, or each well, sparks, but yeah, whether it's a spark or how it goes on a <laughs> on a lithium-ion battery powered something or other. I don't I don't know the mechanism. But, I know lithium ion batteries can lead to ignition. <laughs> and I know BMS is some kind of a regulator on an e-bike that can be on an e-bike that can control that. So that I'd like to know a lot more about that. And whether it's something that can be required or not. Um, I want to go back to the census, the reference to census data, because I don't understand what staff told me about the fact that, that cent we're told that we can look at census data for that, but why that's relevant. And I can't tell you where the census data is mentioned. Is there a staff member that knows what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think it was, uh, I'm trying to look up here. You had mentioned it was on page six. So uh, second paragraph of page six uh, in talking about the um, you know, results of the compared to the Boulder County Census data. Well, I, I'd like staff to do that, but what is that that can be compared and why? Um, is that something we could speak to? Um, how? I don't know, some of the overall visitor service. I mean, it's a, I think it's a, a general statement that I think the main thing we we're trying to highlight is demographic questions that we ask on the survey and or are modeled directly based on the census data. So if you want to be able to see what the differences are, we're calling, we're using all the same categories that exist in the census data. So you can see compared to, to the population of the area who's participated in the survey. So can, can you, you put, that? can you put together a little table? 
that says for the intercept survey, these are the demographics that we've got. These are the demographics from the census for the county. These are the demographics for the, from the census for the city. Can we get that kind of a table so we can see what you're describing in that paragraph? Yeah. I don't think any of us on the board are going to do that. I'm not going to you say that. I'm not going to argue. <laughs> um, I think we're getting close to our time, but my question is if any of us find that we've forgotten something from tonight, can we send you an email or is that, do we need to speak now or forever hold up? Please. I think it's fine to send an email. I think um, uh, sooner rather than later, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> the night before the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what we're going to do is we're going to get this list of how many items you got, Casey? <laughs> I didn't number that, but we are halfway through page two. <laughs> And uh, we'll we'll need to assess, you know, what we're able to pull together between now and the memo time, and then what might have to trickle out even post memo. And then if we're unable to uh, meet a request, we will provide information that uh, these pieces of what you all wanted, for whatever reason, we're un unable to meet until daylight. The fact that we're not going to be able to meet that, so you, so you're not left wondering. I thought I asked for something. I'm not seeing it. We'll let you know if we're not able to meet that request. Sounds good. Marnie, can I get a copy of your presentation? You had a matrix there of what um, was allowed in every um, land manager's territory that I, I wish I would have been able to screenshot, but you're too fast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will provide that to Leah and have that sent out to the board members. We'll also post it to the um, to the project web page after tonight as well. Just don't forget, Michelle, our, the mission of the open space program may, may not be reflective of adjoining public land management agencies. Um, so there, there may be different missions, even though we're trying to you know, cooperatively work together. Understood. Um, and I, I'm likely not to be here in the December meeting. I'm going to be traveling to Asia, and I. I'm not sure I'm going to be in a spot with good internet access, so I, I will watch all that. We'll keep you in mind. We'll, we'll miss you. <laughs> yeah. We'll miss you, right? And I'll be jet lagged when we get back, so that's going to be we'll, fun. We'll be mindful that you're one of the five. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Travel safely is all I have to say. With a whole a whole pile of masks. Oh yes. Okay, anything else from anybody before we move from this to the next item on the agenda? Okay. Thanks, Dan. Colin. Thanks, Marty. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to make an announcement uh, because this uh, particular meeting is going to be held before we all meet next, but, uh, well, I should actually take that back you all are you all are meeting we're meeting <laughs> uh, next week um, well, but you are too I, I will try to be there uh, <laughs> on december 14th is our next osbt meeting the night before uh five o'clock is going to be our community annual uh community meeting to summarize our prairie dog management activities of the previous year and the daylight uh what we're foreseeing for management activities in the forthcoming year so just a reminder of that, uh, uh, and that's in your packet. Uh, I think Allison laid it out pretty well as far as daylighting that. And we're also going to come back at the January meeting, uh, and Heather will summarize, uh, provide some summary comments of what we heard and what we presented. So you'll you'll get a recap of that. And as that's well. a Zoom. Uh, yeah, that's a Zoom, and then what will be in person on January to summarize. Yeah. So.
Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, so today we had a, a couple of community questions that came in regarding uh, filming on open space. Well, it's been happening throughout the city with two locations on open space uh, that happened uh, last week on Bluebell Road, small section of Bluebell, and up at the Lost Gulch Trailhead area. Um, and I, I sent the board a summary of of, of what happened, uh, the, uh, what went into the permit, uh, the fact that we found no findings of any damage uh, through multiple uh, site visits uh, during and after the filming activities. And I, I think I laid out a pretty good description to you all uh, about that, uh, but happy to entertain if there's any questions that you may have on my summary. Um, did they answer there, like a copy of the movie script? Are we going to put it back into the yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I did not get a copy of what there is. That's all I know. I appreciated that email, Dan. And uh, my my only question has to do. The description led me to think, wow, there's lots of staff time invested in this. Uh, not only from Open Space and Mountain Parks, but from other departments as well. Um, is that typical for commercial use permits or exceptional, or are there different tiers of community uh, of commercial use permits? Well, this, uh, this did involve a citywide special events permit as well. So it, the, the collaboration that we did across multiple departments is fairly unique. Yeah. Um, I would view that uh, and Lauren uh, did a lot of the work on it that in our seven years, this was probably definitely an exception. Uh, this was the most complicated uh, because there were so many locations across the city. So there's a film permit, a special city special events permit, an open space commercial and special use per, or commercial use permit, um, and then some some requests kind of popping up across different departments, like they were offering to hire the fire department to work as part of their fire and risk suppression plan. So. There were, I don't know, five plus city departments involved. Um, it was a pretty large scale effort. So yeah, in terms of, I would totally agree this was the, the most intensive. And then we worked with the crew around compensation for work additional to what we would normally provide. So we knew Bluebell, as an example, is highly visited. People are going to be in the area. We have normal winter hours. but we, So they were offering to, you know, can you come train our PAs? Can you stay an extra hour? We'll compensate for that. So, um, in in those ways, it was it was atypical. And did they pay for staff compensation? We are invoicing them tomorrow. Um, and it's it's really just that incremental piece. Like we we want to make sure we're treating any commercial use applicant the same in terms of what our fees are. Our fees are cost recovery. Um, so that's covering like our typical permit administration and monitoring things like that. Um, but because of just the extent of this across the city, it took more time and, and they'll compensate us for that. So Lauren, did they, did we have in our uh, commercial permit uh, form, it, is there an uh, interest in having some kind of open space uh, association with whatever is being proposed or, or you know, is there you any- like credits when the film ro rolls or- No, no, I mean, <laughs> is, there, is there anything that we would give preferential consideration to uh, some commercial filming that, you know, highlighted open space uh, values or something like that? There's no, there's no, there's, um, we make all of our applicants take leave no trace quizzes and pass around like understanding our vision and values uh, before they're permitted to get a permit. Um, but but no, we don't give any preferential treatment in terms of what gets approved and what's not. It's really like kind of letter of the regulations. So if Budweiser came and wanted to do a commercial on open space, we would consider that? We would have a lot of conversations about no alcohol, making sure, we, yeah, <laughs> right. So we would kind of be going line by line through the proposal, which things are permitted, which things are not. Uh, but no, we wouldn't prevent them because of, you know, what they do. Yeah. And tell me what is the current level for the commercial use fee? I believe our, our share of that was between three and $400 of just the base fee. 
And then they also paid for the city special events and any, any other of the city permit fees. Um, and then we have uh, some sign, they, there was one sign that was damaged, $360 and a couple thousand dollars of staff time. So you, you charge the basic fee and then you invoice for the yes yeah. yeah, exactly. The exact number is escaping me, but it's somewhere between three and $400 as the base fee. Yeah, got it, great. And, and is there ever a question of whether to do it or not? It sounds like it's, if you can check all these boxes, anything is okay. Um, it's, it's more or less, if there, I mean, there are so many different permits involved in this one, uh, but if, if they're meeting all of the requirements of the permit, then, then it would be allowable. And this is, this is a typically, in, a, in that, um, we're talking about updating you all on commercial use. Right, that's one why I'm things, asking these questions. Yeah, and one of the things we provided um, in the last update was a cost recovery breakdown. So here's the amount of staff time that goes into this whole program. So uh, Brittany McClure is the operations coordinator on this, on our team, um, who manages permits. And so, you know, I think overall, it's like 15 to 20 hours a week for all of the permits across um, the program. So it's not overwhelming typically this is this was a this was more than than any of the others how far in advance was this scheduled oh two months uh well i shouldn't say that they started reaching out to us over the summer uh the initial proposal was a non-starter and then we started hearing from them a lot more about ways that they wanted to change their proposal in order to meet our requirements they submitted their official request at the end of September, the, the actual application for a permit. So a month in advance. Yeah, like More. four or six weeks, something like that. Yeah. We, we require, we re, our, our structure of our program gives us 14 days to review any of the, any of the applications that come in. Um, they, they didn't start by applying for a permit. They started by calling us to try to understand, here's what we want to do. Is this going to be doable? What are your permit requirements? How would we go about this? Kind of getting more information and training about how they would even start to engage with us. Because it's, if you you're, are you somehow, uh, go, oh, go ahead. because you had to close the trail, are you dictating like when they can do this because of the impacts of our users? Yes, and so we rolled out no weekends <laughs> um, and very minimal closure. So even while they were staging equipment, we required that the trail could remain open while they were doing that. Um, and then I think Dan's email mentioned we had an emergency operation. We halted filming for half a day, even after we approved for them to have that closure. So um, all of that was stipulated in the permit that we were we were going to close for a, a very very limited amount of time, and it would not be at a weekend like on a weekend at Chautauqua. <laughs> Um, so we're really trying to minimize any of the impacts. Flagstaff Road, so the county, they did a similar process with the county, uh, and the county required that the road remain open um, through that entire process. So there were a couple times uh, they were doing some work up on Flagstaff Road. They would halt traffic in order to get a shot on the camera, and then they would allow everybody to pass. So they were really trying to minimize any impacts to the visitors. I don't know whether you were here at the time. Warren, but some of us have a somewhat jaundiced view of commercial permitting on, on open space based on the U.S. Pro Cycle race to the top of Flagstaff, where <laughs> many of us were bruised by that process. And there, so, are, there are many staff that still tell the tales <laughs> of that particular event. But it sounds like if I ask, would you ever do this again? The answer is, of course we would. They... Um, if you were to compare the original proposal to what we permitted, those were vastly different. I hear you. Yeah. But um, if I asked, would you ever do this again? The answer would be yes, right? The answer, uh, if they met all of ours, all of our community vitalities, the fire departments, the police departments, city attorneys, and CMOs regulations. Is these kind of, I've heard in council meetings, I've heard these kinds of programs being advertised or spoken about as great benefits to our community. Um, yeah, and, and they did submit, they did submit to, not to us, but to 
the city manager, I believe, some sort of estimate of their, their budget spend within city limits that had no bearing on our decision at all. But yeah, certainly they, they which is their right to do, or they're touting right. the economic benefit to Boulder right. by them filming here. Yeah. But, you know, I think the other piece of that too, in the permit program, you're building in, like, if there are two violations, you're banned for a certain number of years from holding a permit with us. You know, there's, uh, so we have okay. recourse, like, if anything were to go wrong. So there are consequences. Yeah, oh, absolutely, for any permit holder. And um, we're important. reviewing that every year to look at were there violations and is anybody get their, will anybody have their permit revoked? But we have no violations off of this at all. We sent forestry staff, trails, trailheads, everybody up to those sites to do damage assessments. And, uh, we, we don't have any violations at, that we know of as of now uh, from that permit. How did it intersect with the fitting on, on Enchanted Mesa? Uh, the timing worked out beautifully. They were out by the time. Um, yeah, yeah. we didn't need to change any crew schedules or anything like that. Yeah. If we had like construction going on in the area, we would have asked them to change their dates yeah. for something. Yeah. Well, thank you for guarding our <laughs> guarding our past. team effort for sure. And and to their credit, they were great partners and um, really uh, changed a lot of things to, to make this work. So it all worked out. Good. Anything else? John says no. <laughs> John says no. Michelle says no. Dave says no. That's my cue. Meeting is adjourned.